So guys, you can feel it coming off in the distance. What? Like a thousand Brett Rombergs. What happened? The U.S. Open. <laughs> <laughs> we are warming up in Canada. The hard courts at Flushing Meadows. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We are. We are gambling again. Yes. We've got warm up tournaments. Serena had a good moment. Venus had a bad one. Nadal missed one. Oh, and it looks like we actually have an American hope for the U.S. Open. Who? Taylor Fritz. Oh, my God. He plays Andy Murray today in Canada if it doesn't get rained out. Taylor Fritz, who had a, a pretty decent run in Wimbledon. This is the new great thing. In he, American tennis. He had more than a decent run. He went to the finals. No, he didn't get oh, to the finals. semifinals at a great no, match. No, he, he blew it against Nadal, Nadal. who was doing it right. on like half a body. Semifinals, though. Yeah. The and then Nadal run. had to bow out against Djokovic. It's about time yeah. an American makes a Grand Slam final. You're right. But uh, it's probably going to be two of the same three guys. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be Nadal. It's not going to be Federer. So you think Fritzy has a chance? What's a draw? I don't know. I think Isner has a chance. Hard courts. Isner has been herky jerky. He's been playing some really good tennis and then some inexplicable losses. That's what Isner does. That's also tennis. <laughs> Isner. It is Isner. <laughs> what a strange thing we built around John Isner. I mean, what, where is he ranked in the world right now? Like twenty second. Yeah, is he even ranked? He had so many injuries. Kyrgios just won the most recent tournament. He looks to be really turning it on. Yeah. Taking advantage of all these injuries to the main guys. You see that Juju ran into him in an Atlanta barber shop. I was just going to say that of all the places to be in the weird Atlanta barber shop, it's like all of a sudden Nick Kyrgios, hey, there he was there stunned he that anyone recognized him. <laughs> <laughs> there he was. How could he not be? He's in an Atlanta barber shop. He's also an international superstar, though. But he was in a black barber shop, and if you're an, an international superstar, you're not going to be recognized very much in tennis if you're in a black barber shop in Atlanta. It is shocking. You're right about that. Like, it was only Juju who recognized him. Like, I think Kyrgios went there thinking this is a place no one's going to recognize. Gonna, I'm going to get yes. my hair cut privately. <laughs> no one's going to bother me. And next thing you know. And Juju's walking up to him, and 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 Juju was, or I'm sorry, Curious was legitimately stunned that anybody had any idea who he was. I want uh, tennis will really be back in this country when Nick Curious can walk into an Atlanta black barber shop and walk in on a conversation about forehand grips, and there's <laughs> some old timer in the back that's the talking, about, yeah. that's talking about Sampras, yeah. Yeah. and another guy's got Curious. Mm-hmm. Uh, Isner, by the way, is ranked uh, 33rd in the world. He's never gone past the second round of the U.S. Open. I have him winning it. <laughs> Basically, Isner is, to me, all he is. Uh, I What Riley Opelka said about him and being double-jointed and sort of the physics of the serve from that height where you're just throwing lightning bolts from the top of human perfection on how it is a whip would be used from the feet to the double jointed elbow through the hand. Basically that movement is 33rd in the world. It's not a player. It's not a human being, a vessel. It's not, it's just the ability to be built like that can make you a career in tennis where you make a living uh, and travel the globe uh, with an, a rocket serve. I understand why Nadal and Isner and even Opelka have all had their injury problems recently. Opelka and Isner too. Those frames, if you stand next to them, you notice we've seen, we've stood next to football players. We've stood next to basketball players. You're not really usually impressed by the size of athletes when it comes to tennis players i am because of how lean they are they take a pounding on that hard court surface that body moving that much stopping and starting your own body is working against you it doesn't make sense but dan, I, dan you're right as it pertains to isner that guy has made a career off a of serve he's never been to a grand slam semifinal. <laughs> I don't even think he's been to a quarterfinal. You can make a good career just <laughs> serving. I do want to say, Mike, you said that you don't find most athletes physically impressive. I think 
I think you that's a six four prism. You're yes. you're you're very tall. Yeah. I think most people, your average American is very wildly impressed Fair by the physicality. I, I, of I, I am huge. Thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that's accurate though, because Mike has stood next to Brady or or Peyton Manning or some of these guys. Brady did surprise me with Philip how big Rivers, he was. Philip yeah. Rivers, all of them and you're like Whoa. Rogers. Rogers, well, he surprised me because of how thick he's gotten and how muscular oh, and yeah. His, his body type's really totally strange. Drained. Yeah. I got to try some of that ayahuasca. <laughs> the ayahuasca does not help uh, with the... Well, it helped him. I mean... With the figure. Uh, you were more dismissive uh, than I thought you should have been on the ayahuasca stuff yesterday. Why? Me? Yeah. Oh, Mike was. I, yeah, yeah, I was. I, look, it, I, I went back and listened to it. I was probably just projecting my my general dislike for how Aaron Rodgers had blatant disregard for the pandemic. You know what? In in retrospect, I was probably wrong in him trying to search all these remedies. I'm just kind of over him and uh, and what he's trying to project lately, because at the heart of it, I still think about the pandemic and how reckless his behavior was and how betrayed I felt by him lying he can couch it however he wanted to he, he lied if you're gonna be that way be transparent about it i think some of us have pivoted a little bit uh, on our stance when it comes to the vaccine but if you and say boosters. if you're gonna be that way be transparent about it that didn't buy kyrie irving anything like kyrie irving wasn't transparent about it kyrie irving kept switching his reasons for it kyrie irving is a bullshit artist no no, I'm not. I'm not giving I don't Kyrie Irving the there, benefit of being I, transparent. I don't believe there's a way that someone could have made that decision that would have been palatable to you. That that transparent, not transparent, hypocritical, inconsistent. I mean, no, but I'm, that's what I'm saying. Right. I'm saying that outside of getting the shot, anyone could have made that choice and framed it however it is they wanted, and they still would have been treated like a pariah. Fair enough. I mean, they're mitigating circumstances. Like, I'm not up in arms because Mel Kuyper Jr. didn't get vaccinated. Uh, granted, some time had passed. Initially, if you're a world-class athlete, I do think that you have a responsibility to get to get out there for your teammates. Even if I had my own personal reservations, I would have I would have done what Wiggins did. I, I just would have been there for my team. So I do think you can judge someone's character when it comes to that stuff because they let people down. Uh, in retrospect probably too harsh i'll admit that but no kyrie irving i'm not projecting on the kyrie irving the same stuff that i'm doing to certain baseball players that refuse to get vaccinated i think novak Djokovic is an idiot but i've known where he stood from the very beginning and he didn't bullshit me I've, I've known very clearly from the inception of the the pandemic where novak Djokovic stood on stuff and why he stood on it kyrie irving just tried to keep lying to me he, he just kept lying about the reasons it was it was it was a shell game for, for his motivation. Ultimately, I just think he likes chaos. And he likes to project that he's above it all, that yes. he's smarter than us, that we just don't get what's going on and with that, Kyrie Irving. And, and it's that, similar with Aaron Rodgers. That's where Aaron's getting yeah. me. That's where, yeah. Aaron, he, like, he's a smart guy. But you're not that smart. Stop trying to project that onto me. So he's making the uh, the media rounds. I don't know if you guys noticed this. It used to be the Pat McAfee show, and it was our show. Those were the two main shows he would go on. So this is right around the time I would normally request Aaron Rodgers. Like, we'd get him, like, mid to late August going into September. And I'm still willing to send out the re uh, the request to Tom Fanning with the, pa uh, with the Packers. I want to send out that request. But I noticed yesterday he went on part of my take. And so I'm wondering, based on the frosty exchange that Mike had with Aaron Rodgers at Lake Tahoe, I think maybe he's replaced us with those guys. And so I don't know what to do here in terms of sending out the request. I, I will mean, say, the part of my take guys went in for the kill. They did. In that interview. Yeah. Yeah. They, Quite like, literally. They, I mean, they said, how many grandmas do you think? <laughs> Whew. Yeah. I, I was cringing which <laughs> by the way fair play because they want to cover their asses for like putting forward the point of view that i think a lot of people had but that is uncomfortable to look aaron Rodgers in the eye and do that yeah aaron Rodgers took exception to pft's question about hey how many people do you think you've killed 
Oh. You mentioned not being up in arms on Mel Kuyper, and I want... Go ahead and make the request, Stugatz. Make the request. Oh, I'm going to make it. Yeah. Uh, up in Stupidity. arms as a phrase. Um, <laughs> as a phrase, does that up in arms means to get so outraged that you then get armed, or you, you arm yourself, or you throw your arms I th in I the air? I think it's exasperation. You throw your arms up like, what is happening here? Uh, the thing that you said that you feel comfortable judging someone's character for letting their teammates down, I can sort of step outside of this conversation and say, if trying to be there for my teammates runs contrary to, I get to choose what I put in my body. Even as the science is there that would indicate you've heard all of my opinions on this, so I don't want to cover the ground again. I think that as a public health measure, if the science is telling you that you can help others and not kill grandmas um, with a vaccine that science is telling you is safe, that's the route that I would go. But I'm not sure I would if I'm somebody who's like, nope. Nothing's going in my body unless I want it in my body, no matter the pressure from government, no matter the pressure from employer, from teammates, from angry mob. Nothing is going in my body. The one that's not going to topple that is I have to be there for my teammates like that one. I, I have to be there for my teammates, maybe for society, but for my teammates. Eh. Well, I was there for my teammates. I didn't actually want the vaccine. I had COVID before. All I got was lower back pain. I did it for other folks. I did it so I can keep on living my life and not have the guilt that one would deal but with. You made if it they work, weren't. though, is what I'm saying. You, you, you're when you say your teammates. If if the line, if you can articulate to me as someone who just um, does not want to is going to otherwise be careful in every other way and doesn't want to put something in their body by pressure from anywhere that isn't their own choice uh workplace stuff the ability to go to work if you're willing to cost yourself the dollars for not doing that and behave appropriately outside of that i'm just telling you that being there for my teammates doesn't rise to the level of oh okay now i understand why you would do that but what if your teammate is also a guy you consider to be one of your best friends and he made an investment in you and you made an investment in him and that's kevin durant and kyrie irving you I'm, don't think kyrie I, has some responsibility you're, you're saying this i'm not saying he doesn't have some responsibility i'm saying for me on the checklist scale it right. doesn't topple okay if i'm a f person who's firm about nobody but me tells me what goes in my body not government not public pressure not bosses not anybody um i i this is not how it's being articulated in this realm he's right when he says that kyrie irving was all over the place he's right when he says that aaron Rodgers was trying to mask it because he was trying to stay away from the angry mob uh djokovic has been a, a, a consistent clown show and a clown show but his clown show has been born of not putting it in my body and he doesn't have teammates no and there's a language barrier and he's also he doesn't try to try to pretend like he's this big intellectual uh novak djokovic is very much a, a one sighted individual he's all he's all but about Mike, he's done tennis. he's done photo shoots knowing he's positive for for covid like he hasn't handled it he, in a responsible to, way he went to a party in croatia i think when everything was in lockdown, we we've known, and he had this reputation about being a weirdo with his body, even prior to the pandemic. If you, if you're in tennis circles, you know that he's kind of considered to be a bit of a weirdo. I don't disagree with anything that you're saying. Dan. In fact, I, I actually agree with it where, where I stopped though, is like, okay, you can make that decision for you, but the consequences are judgment. The consequences are peer pressure. They work. <laughs> Sometimes, Bullying works in a very positive fashion and they correct some behavior. I'm not down with the decision that he made to lie about it. I'm also not down with the original decision to not get the vaccine because I think it to be a very selfish act, but I can get past that. I have very, I have so many people in my life that decided against vaccinations or decided against boosters that I respect their decision. I hang around them and I love them. It is fine. But when there's a locker room full of people that depend on you for their livelihood, when there's when you are, believe it or not, a role model, even though he, no one he, he didn't sign up for, for that life. When you have a microphone and you have this this unbelievable access to speak to people and actually change minds in that state, 
if Aaron Rodgers is pro-vax, he can actually make a difference. I was just not down with his messaging at all. It was confusing. And then he just started turning himself into knots with this weird logic. He went into the political realm and he got Roganized. And it was just, it was very disappointing for me as someone that considers him still to be their favorite quarterback of all time. What I feel like we've been watching the last, I don't know, five years of Aaron Rodgers is a combination of midlife crisis with uh, searching through the family rubble of patterns, like whatever it is that passed for love in his house. He has excommunicated everyone who was in his family and now is through relationships, trying to learn, trying to absorb other things that are outside of, of his realm. And uh, I have viewed it as a wandering search that has some potholes in it. And I've been disappointed by some of this stuff too, but I'd like to talk to him about it because whether we it's, don't have a shot, um, you don't think so. I mean, I'm hitting send in, in a couple of minutes, but uh, I don't I, think we, I, I don't feel like we have a did, shot. Did, at he, did he think the, the pardon my take guys were going to go easy on him? Did they think it was going to be no, soft? Like I'm not going no, to, I'm not going to no. attack him. No, he no. It's like he and big cat have this very contentious relationship. A lot of it's, for show most I mean it's all for for a show but Aaron Rodgers can handle it I'm sure Aaron Rodgers will join this show again uh, I, I don't he doesn't have a problem with with facing criticism he'll put his spin on it and he'll have the final word because that's usually that the dynamic when you welcome Aaron Rodgers onto your program what he has an intimidating presence he's short he has shown multiple times in his life that he will cut people out that he doesn't necessarily vibe with anymore there were people in the media that he had really good relationships that went out publicly when he was doing all that stuff during the pandemic or during the political cycles, and he doesn't talk to them anymore. So he applies that. If he did it to his family, he certainly can do it to our show. Yep. Again, though, the age of when it is between 35 and 45 that a whole lot of people sort through their life when they've arrived especially in a place like him, the maximum of success. And hey, wasn't I supposed to be happy? Isn't me getting all the things I wanted? Isn't that a source of happiness? Or do I now have to question, make ask some questions of why it is I'm not as happy? And he's talked about the therapy done uh, scientifically going through, like I said, all of his family stuff before he arrives at the dating relationships on his way to a different kind of love and experiments with some of these things like ayahuasca that might not have been his choice if he had not been in committed relationships with uh, with women who were trying to take him on a loving path. It's an illuminating perspective. I appreciate it. I'm just not really sure what about a guy going through several relationships, growing his hair out, hitting the gym and getting a tattoo screams midlife crisis to you. <laughs> Can you guys say some nice things about Aaron so I can send some clips to Tom Fanning with the Packers? Just stand anything. The greatest quarterback ever might do something. I need some help here because right now it's just me. I said he's the greatest me, quarterback ever. I'm telling you right, he's going to appear on Stupidity or Mystery Crate. No, I mean, one of those two. He's, Floppy he's, cat. Look, yeah. I, he's good on Jeopardy. I'm not going to. I'm not going to bullshit anybody. I'll take it, Roy. You got it. I'm not going to bullshit anybody. He, he, I think he knows very clearly because he, he was frosty with me. I think Send he knows. him that clip, Stugatsev, just Roy. Here's the Dan <laughs> Levitard show with Stugatsev. You will be on Montgomery and Company. You. <laughs> <laughs> he was good on Moco, Jeopardy. I, mean. <laughs> I want to I ask you guys something funny and ridiculous as uh, Jimmy Butler wanders Ecuador with very, very long hair. And as famed podcaster Duncan Robinson <laughs> whimpers into a microphone, Jimmy Butler is so mean with his trash talk in practices. The thing that I wanted to ask you guys is if we've moved away from coaches doing two a days to football players and putting their hands on football players and disrespecting football players because climate and culture have made it so that the Washington commanders have to be named the Washington commanders now and can no longer uh, run a toxic workplace environment. I'm dead serious when I ask you guys, if you have a human resources complaint on Jimmy Butler in the heat organization, where does that go? 
I'm dead serious. Like, it, and 10 years or 20 years from now, like, if if it's so personal, if the trash talk is so personal. It goes to Haslam. <laughs> so it has, goes with you to your it's, grave, it's, Dan. It's, it's Haslam It goes resources. right up your ass, Dan. That's where you can shove your HR violations. I'm serious, though, about if changing workplaces, if we start applying to sports. I mean, uh, who was it that said this? It was Chris Sale the other day. He's like, I don't work in Bank of America. Don't videotape me tearing up a clubhouse. If I did it in Bank of America, then it's not allowed, but that's not where I work. But I'm sure that's not where Daniel Snyder thought that he worked. I'm sure that once upon a time, Daniel Snyder's like, no, nah, man, frat boy, that's why I got a team, isn't it? Like, just have the whole culture. We, the cheerleaders are mine. And then it all changed on him. The whole the America workplace very quickly yeah. okay and so yeah. i'm dead serious when i ask you guys i know it's not here now but if if the the rick fox stories of kobe bryant would test you until rick fox had to kobe bryant would test him by lining up in the spot where rick fox was to run like just alpha hing alpha ing him every practice until rick fox had to come up to him and say okay do we have to fight do, do, is this, do we have to fight? And then Kobe left it alone. Jordan actually punched Steve Kerr in the face. I mean, didn't Rick Fox have like 10 years on Kobe when Kobe was doing that shit? Wow. And so, and so I ask you because Jimmy Butler's clearly this at 35, this is going to be unpleasant to be around if it's not already. It's been unpleasant from day one for Jimmy Butler. Okay, but you can tolerate more of it when it's 47 in the finals is what I'm saying. Of course you can. At 35, still thinking he's that guy. You think you think it's going to be a lot different than it is with Westbrook? You think he's going to come, he's going to look in a mirror and be like, yeah, I can be a fourth player, fifth player, come off the bench. No, no, that is not going to go well for the end of Jimmy Butler's tenure. This, he is going to be delusional about his ability to his last breath in the NBA it's a fascinating point you bring up, though. What happens in a world in which professional sports becomes HR? And in some ways, wasn't that what Jonathan Martin and Richie Incognito I, was? I, I know. And think about how poorly we handled that as but, a sports media, as a sports culture. And Jonathan Martin was weeded out survival of the fittest. Richie Incognito retired last year because that wins in that sport. Like there's a cruelty, a competitive cruelty that will absolutely eviscerate the meek. And you cannot be the person going to human resources. But for real, though, take out the hypothetical. I know it's ridiculous, right? Now. I know you can't imagine if you're listening it to this. But my guess is that whatever Jimmy Butler has done to Duncan Robinson, all of us here would crumble under it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. Totally. I know I like would. We would, we would have yeah. a coworker who now, who now we were, we hated and were afraid of who had to be our teammate. And in the name of, and the spirit, like it's hard to go to sleep if you're Jonathan Martin and what you're walking into every day is Richie incognito. It will get weeded out. And when I say it'll get weeded out, Duncan Robinson wasn't playing at the end. Duncan Robinson, you're at these microphones telling me how weak Duncan Robinson is and that you don't trust him. And I'm legitimately asking what I know is a ridiculous question because I would hate to work with someone like Jimmy Butler, have him have power over me and have him always clubbing me over the head with that power because he's in, because he's in charge. And I don't know what you do about it if somebody comes to you and like this is all handled in house and everything else. But let's just say Duncan Robinson right now were to come out publicly and say, Yes, the Miami Heat has a human resources department. I went to it because of what Jimmy Butler oh, did geez. to me for the fourth no, straight man. practice. No, no, yeah, no. it's a bad idea. Don't don't mm. don't, nice. don't do this to Duncan Robinson. Yeah, don't even on. throw out this no. hypothetical. Right. He, he's just leave it alone. Yeah, yeah. just no. But why though? No, because it's because, man. Mm, Jimmy. Just, he's Duncan Robinson. It's Jimmy Butler. Mm. There's dynamics here at play. Not we're not doing HR violations for core trash talk. In the what are we gonna do? <laughs> MMA weigh-ins next? <laughs> oh, it, he was mean to me during the way in. You, you, you want to subpoena a promo for WrestleMania next? <laughs> in uh, in the spirit of the Sopranos, I do like the idea of it not being Duncan Robinson, but Udonis Haslam being in therapy, like being in therapy. Like uh, Udonis Haslam making an HR complaint is a funny skit. 
like <laughs> <laughs> bringing up 17 years ago something Zoe did. Like I've worked in this place for so long. Can't you guys clean up the culture? I keep complaining to Riley, but he's always in charge. I mean, to be fair, Udonis would probably be the source of some HR I, I, complaints no, but along it, the way. That's why it's funny to make it him going into an office, like just wa walking I've in. I've never been more sure that we have to trade Duncan Robinson now. Yeah, you know what, just you're get right. get him out of I'm here. I'm with Mike. I can't, Dan opening up this door. When he says it's so, so personal, I'm asking you guys, what do you imagine it's like to be Duncan Robinson? You are struggling with your confidence. You are not playing. And now in practice, what you're getting is 47 points in the final. Jimmy Butler just pounding you over the head again and again with cruelty that is personal. Okay, what I do is I give it right back. It's like prison rules, yeah. Dan. What I say is I make I'm 19 dirty. I make 19 million dollars a year <laughs> and according to statistics I'm one of the greatest three point shooters of all time. I have a different game than yours. Shut the fuck up, Jimmy. Your hair looks stupid. That is something along those go? lines. I think the hair looks great. I think when you travel through Ecuador you have to do it with long hair. I do. Good yeah. show. Thank you. What do you mean what? good show? Good show. Uh, thank you, Woody. I appreciate it. What? I don't I felt good about it. I, mean, I, I don't understand what is being said there. Why it's what do being you mean? theorized? Why do you have to travel through Ecuador? It with just long feels like, you know, it feels like one of those things you should do when you're, you know, traveling through Ecuador. You're, exploring the, you're exploring the world, <laughs> presumably exploring the wilderness. You become one with nature. You right. let your exploring hair grow, yourself, let right. your facial yeah. hair grow. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily, you know, concerned with being kempt. You're yeah. exploring. Yes. Yep. Exactly. Exploring yourself. Isn't that what... Did you say exactly there or did it just stumble it? Did it? It was just exact. Uh, it was. Yeah, I ejected. I mean, <laughs> Aaron Rodgers, isn't that all he's doing? Isn't he just publicly searching? I guess I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm about to hit send. I finished it with uh, the email with, hey, I'm going to send you a great uh, clip from Roy Bellamy in a bit about uh, the greatness of Aaron Rodgers. I need something. I need it from you, Dan. Maybe Mike, Roy, it's fine. I'm going to send it. It's the best I have right now. But I need someone to say something nice about Aaron Rodgers. Anybody? Uh, Dan? If he comes on, Jesus. I'll do ayahuasca with him. How about that? Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> That's a Live in studio. Tony throwing. I'm no, it's, no, this is ours. Live in studio. Do you realize how much that would coming kill here? <laughs> the, the experience of ayahuasca? The the thing that, uh, whether it's this or DMT, okay? The, the, I hit send. The thing that Mike Tyson says about the licking of the poisonous toad the thing that you hear about with ayahuasca, Aaron Rodgers is talking a lot about. He's talking about unconditional love. But what you hear is the killing of the ego. Mike Tyson, when he talks about this, uh, says that he wanted to fight the shaman because it was the scariest experience of his life because he was so vain and had so much ego that the killing of that ego seemed to him like death, like he was dying. And so he was trying to fight the shaman with uh, he'd lost his motor skills. He thought he was moving really fast. The video shows him moving very slow because he's in another sphere. His brain chemistry has been altered. Ayahuasca does some of the same things where it connects you to a source. It makes you feel like there's something bigger than you out there, that your ego is small. It's, it's not relevant in the face of the expanse of the universe. That's the theory behind all of it. That's what the search is. That's a, he is not doing psychedelics. It's for mind expansion. Well, it's if, Timothy if, Leary stuff. It's, if Aaron is investigating something that would make his ego smaller, I support him fully. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't help manifest the yes uh, that's waiting. what aaron Rodgers would tell you uh, i'm waiting for a no it's the first time i've sent that email feeling like the response is i've always sent it knowing it's going to be a yes and now i've sent it feeling like it's going to be a no. we're all adults here i could feel yeah. disappointed in aaron and I, and I don't think it's a door that's closed even though i'm telling history you history would suggest Mike, that uh he's probably left us in the dust i asked him i said uh I said, are you to come on the show again? And he said, I don't know. When we saw him in Tahoe, this yeah. is right before your frosty handshake with him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you had a warm embrace with him. I did, but. um, You always do those too. I do. 
You're right. You also don't take inventory of the stuff that you say. You've been. I know what I said. You've been hard on Aaron. I know. Um, I was very hard on Aaron. In fact, I think you pointed out that no one was harder on Aaron than I was. Yeah. But he gave me a big hug and said he loves me. He understood why I was hard on him. He didn't understand what you and Dan were doing. He understood after he heard my mom had passed away. My grandfather. And he pulled me in for a second hug at a time where I thought he was vaccinated and he wasn't. Oh. I mean, he jeopardized my life. I think you're rationalizing. I love you, Aaron. <laughs> I think you're rationalizing as you, as you should. I think uh, that stuff came into the public dialogue when you and I were going through losing loved ones to COVID. Right. Uh, and that is part of our experience. I don't think you really need that to, to make a judgment call on, on how Aaron behaved in that moment but i said what i said i stand by it i I, listen i understand that i'm just telling you in the pecking order it doesn't seem like you stand by it well i do stand by what i said but he's good with me so in the pecking order because he gave me a hug again and said he loves me last year i just got two hugs he jeopardized my life he gave me a second hug and this year he gave me a hug and said i love you now that's different, Mike. There was no I love you last year. This year I got an I love you. I mean, I our relationship is growing. Yours I, is going the other way. I don't want to beg Aaron Rodgers to come on I here. Do. And I assumed that you were hugging him and he was hugging you the way that you do everything, which is insincerely. That it doesn't. No, he that, gave me a real hug, man. He did. He gave me a real hug. I well, mean, why would time. he be mad? It doesn't even make sense. Why would he be more mad at Mike than he is at you? I'm not sure. It was just a frosty handshake with Mike. I'm not sure. Maybe he views Mike as an extension of you. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> but how are because you not I, an I extension because of I, me? Because, because I'm like, not. Because I mean. God's, everyone, everyone knows whatever he says doesn't necessarily stick to him. I right. Was, yeah. I was strident. In my uh, Aaron Rodgers takes, I think what we're doing collectively right now with Aaron is a little sad and pathetic. That's him, what I think. Let him, let him go and fly. Let him go do other shows. It's 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 totally fine. But look, I'm comfortable with consequences for my actions. It seems as though he may not be, but I am totally fine with projecting a take onto the air and understanding that if this goes out there and Aaron hears it, it jeopardizes my relationship. That was me being candid and authentic during that moment in time. This is still me being candid inauthentic i need to lie right now though I'm not gonna okay give you a lie. i mean give me something i'm not gonna give anything. you if aaron's here all's forgiven i mean anything i, I can have know. i can have a dialogue with aaron about where i feel my relationship with him as the greatest quarterback of all time me just being a fan went south but it's also kind of pathetic i'm not gonna keep putting the it's guy not on the pedestal kind of pathetic this whole thing this everything that's happened here for the last 25 minutes you could remove the kind of and inflate the pathetic on steroids oh. Yeah. Like inject it weekly with, H- with stupidity. With, with Keep talking. H- this is what we're choosing to do. This is what we're choosing to do. It might be indicative of how things are going for us right now. Part of my take goes to Green Bay, interviews him, and PFT asks him to his face how many people he's killed. Yeah. We lament a frosty handshake we had in Tahoe <laughs> without asking him, "Hey, can you actually come by the the set? We we haven't even." Press sent on your interview request. Yeah, no, I did. I hit send. Well, this is another yeah. problem, though. Okay, this is another problem because we are not going to Green Bay under any circumstances. Why? For, just because? Why would we ever go to Green Bay? You want to go across Lambeau the nation Field? in an RV? Frozen tundra. I have been, and that's enough. Once was enough. And you're fraudulent because you should say what uh, you really think about Canton on the air. <laughs> I don't want to do that. It's football heaven. That's all. It's an interesting place. Let's just leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to go to Green Bay or chase him around. But when we left ESPN, that was with Chris Cody in tow, and when we were, when we were in Tahoe with Chris Cody. He did not realize that one of his jobs was to go ask people to be on, which strikes me as a enormous blind spot on what he was there to do. To be fair, I didn't realize that I had to be sober. You still got a guess, though. Aaron, yeah, I did. <laughs> you were hammered. You so David, I was, Wells, <laughs> David Wells I just I called came him over. Eagle he, he smelled your breath and sat next to you. 
I don't think, was it Wells you got or was it Iguodala? I got Iguodala. Yeah, you did. You were stumbling around. <laughs> Iguodala no. cannot count. That can't count. Oh, my co worker. Dan, there's no way he's on unless Mike asks him. I'm telling you right now. That's By true. the way, Jets Packers at the uh, Frozen Tundra, October 16th. A little ready? I mean, <laughs> I got a couple of Jets questions for you. How'd oh, you Jesus. feel about Robert Sala saying over the weekend, Joe Flacco is a. Uh, starting quarterback in this league i like to have a uh, my backup i prefer him to be a starter so i like that like a guy who can start at any moment because we still don't know if zach wilson's good we still don't know you know zach wilson can get hurt any quarterback can get hurt anytime so i like having a starting quarter, uh, quarterback as my backup it feels good no, you it don't. really does a super bowl winning starting quarterback as my you, backup no guys you can guys. win me a game Woody. no you can you win can't. me a game if joe flacco enters the game at any point this season for the New York Jets, yeah. your season is over. Well, I know, From the he, moment he steps on the field. little spot there start, is, though. No, there mean, is nothing to be gained. Kobe if anything, we had, like, the game and a half of Mike White. Oh, Mike White is good. I love oh, that. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, thought, I, like, I thought they had a quarterback. That I mean. was, you remember that? Was, that, that went across the sky. That should have, he like, a, great. a meteor's name. It was. It should be remembered forever. It is 1-11th of Jeremy Lin. It was. <laughs> it, it, it got time squared <laughs> just the same. It got. Let's talk more. Do you remember? <laughs> Stu got. All of New York was so desperate for anything excellent in football that Mike White became. Everybody was saying, well, wait a minute. Maybe he's the guy. 37 of 45, 405 yards, three touchdowns. I mean, they beat the Bengals. Everything was <laughs> in the Super Bowl. Super Bowl. <laughs> so, guys, I'm looking at your, your depth chart right now. Yeah. You got a lot of talent on this team. I know, but Becton got hurt. He Beck, did. Yeah, you're, you're right. Second year in a row. Yeah. Yeah. Serious time too. But in terms of skill positions, you got Hall, you got Carter in the backfield, you got Elijah Moore, Corey Davis, you drafted Garrett Wilson, you saw Braxton Berrios, who was a pro bowler, not at that position, but still a pro bowler. I know. I just have no idea if the quarterback's in. Well, you got the worst roster in the division, right? I, well, I don't know. Hang on a second. No. Are, have know. you been Patriots? reading have you been reading the reports of what's coming out of the Patriots? They can't run an offense. And this Matt Patricia as offensive coordinator oh, thing nice. is disaster. going disastrously. Yeah. Yeah. They like people will say they can't. Mac Jones has said that they can't run a play without there being dead ends. That he just is rolling out to the right and there's nothing. That every time you look at that offense, they're just throwing their hands up in the air, no idea what to do. That offense has well, been a what, disaster. What happened to Belichick's quotes that there were dramatic improvements in? Mac, Mac Jones had Mac Jones. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Mac you lost Josh McDaniel. What are we doing here? Okay, right. you can't, though, tell me. Yes, you lost your offensive coordinator. But you cannot tell me that Mac Jones has made dramatic improvement and the offense is going to be worse, can you? I think you can. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, look at Mac Jones now. Look at his body type. Year two in... in in that organization. I just think if a quarterback gets better, your offense gets better. Like that's uh, you, that the quarterback skill level is more important than your coordinator. They the lost, coordinator matters. Yeah. But they lost Josh McDaniels. who was considered to be one of the best in the game. And Patricia is their offensive coordinator. He was their defensive coordinator from 12 to 17. And now he's just going to go, Hey, you know what? I'm an offensive well, guy. What now. is that? Somebody explain that to me. Cause this is the first I'm hearing of that. I did not realize that Matt Patricia is now an offensive guy. That guy was clown <laughs> show in Detroit. And forget just let let's put the Patricia thing aside, which is shocking that I just learned that. Uh, is it know. true? Do we know this is true? No, he is right now. Yeah, he's the offensive coordinator. Yes, the wide receiver. Wow. One, the is he wide still receiver with the pencil. I mean, how does I that work? So. Yeah, the wide receiver one is Devonte Parker in New England. You look at their skill positions; they have good tight ends. But I would actually give the edge to the Jets in the skill positions. The bottom of the AFC being <laughs> studied in August. And it's not the Dolphins. <laughs> and so, so here, here's the report. This is from Tom Coran, who covers the Patriots. The Patriots' number one offense today has been distressingly bad. Run stuffs, aborted plays, would-be sacks, distress lobs into traffic just to get ball out, beginning to feel it's less the new offense and more the post-scar cycle of offensive line coaches. They are perpetually overwhelmed. 
Distressingly what? Distressingly bad. Mm. The New England Patriots offense. Wow. So I believe to answer your question about Patricia, they have not named an offensive coordinator similar to when Brian Flores was calling defensive plays for the Patriots, but was not their defensive coordinator. Belichick likes to do this weird shell game of having assistant coaches, but not giving them titles and believe it or not heading into training camp, the offense, there was an offensive coordinator competition. And it was going to be one of two people that were going to call offensive plays for the Patriots. It was either going to be Matt Patricia or Joe Judge. Those were their two choices for, off- for offensive play caller. And it's been Patricia who's been calling the plays for them in camp. Stugatz, we have spent 20 years studying this team. I do want, even though it is August, for the audience to understand the absurdity of 45 year old Tom Brady leaving there <laughs> and having this season an over under before they got Julio Jones of 34 and a half or 35 and a half touchdown passes <laughs> as the huddle that he left with a quarterback who has improved <laughs> who has improved dramatically according to the coach is distressingly bad <laughs> I'm always on the hunt for good new programming, Mike. And now I think a lot of us, many of you listening to this, have reached a breaking point where you realize, okay, if I want to watch something behind a paywall streaming service, if I'm going to spend on Peacock or one of these others that I do not have outside of the ones that I know make good stuff or the ones that are part more of my habit, My familiar habit, because Netflix makes a lot of money just because people have had Netflix for a long time. Are you guys recommending anything these days? Apple Plus is making some cool shit. They are are very discerning. They've got all the money in the world. They do not make a lot of things. So they they have taken a different lane than Netflix. Netflix is like, just pump it out. Just keep pumping out. Apple's saying, we've got all your money. That's not how we're going to do it. We're going to have Tom Hanks on a battleship in a movie. We're going to do big things. I have all the streaming services. I I have them all. And uh, I've seen the deterioration of uh, of Netflix over the last few years, as has everyone. Um, They're blaming password sharing really they should look in a mirror uh, i m- i missed out on last week's conversation that you had with mike sure i did enjoy the social clips that you put out because i am very distressed as someone that loves the hbo max platform and also has access to discovery plus i'm not cool with them making the content decisions for probably the greatest content studio of our lifetimes hbo over the course of, they reinvented it's not tv it's hbo they reinvented dramatic television series but now i think apple is best positioned out of all of them apple tv plus as you mentioned they're discerning and they kind of limped out there at the beginning the morning show very mixed reviews i like the morning show it was big and flashy and you saw what they were trying to do they were trying to capitalize on the moment they threw every star at it and the writing was one note off and it got weaker as the series progressed but that was a big giant swing like they had you've got aniston reese witherspoon it was a giant cast i I saw a show that had no idea what it wanted it to be and then finally towards the end of this the season they they kind of figured it out and i'm gonna I'll keep with it because I think the talent on the show is too good for it to not find its way. And there are shows that start out a little slower and that's fine. But for, for, uh, for all mankind was another show that I actually watched a little bit of, and I kind of liked it, but I it just got lost in the shuffle. But then Ted Lasso came along. Severance. Did Severance do anything I for you? I still haven't gotten into oh, Severance. Severance. I was, here's, I was supposed to get into Severance last night. I was supposed to, I had planned my evening around Severance. I was going to start this show. It's slow and the expectation. I'll be curious to see how you feel about it now that the expectations have been raised. I, I've i told you before that the choices Ben Stiller has been making since before Tropic Thunder, uh, I think he's got a Showtime show that's great. Escape from Denimora. Um yeah, that he, he's taking a giant swing with Severance. But Apple, they only have like five shows. And so when you go through their interface... You have a limited selection. I was going to get to Severance, but then I landed on this show, Blackbird. And I had seen a tweet earlier in the day that had me curious. And I saw the trailer with my wife and the trailer absolutely hooked me in because I'm a fan. One of my favorite shows of all time was this very little watched uh, 
direct TV show called Kingdom about a family and MMA and all sorts of family dynamics. You should tell people that. Yeah, so if they I don't even know back, where it's available. If they want to go back and see it, Kingdom Kingdom was very good, and one of the bit players in Kingdom uh, stars in Blackbird. It's still on Netflix, still on Netflix uh, yeah. Ryan Cortez tells me. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, it's still on Netflix. Go check out Kingdom because it was not watched at all when it was I really on liked air. it. And it ended up being a star-making vehicle for one Paul Walter Hauser, who went on to be cast in a, in a Clint Eastwood movie. I think he's a supremely talented actor. He can play creepy, but get you to care about the character emotionally better than damn near anyone right now. And he's in this show alongside Taron Edgerton, who I believe to be a bit of a ham. But oh, come on. That's neither here nor there. there. I don't love <laughs> him as an there? actor. He is a, he's he's not, a bit of a ham. Well, it's his body. Let's be honest. Well, his body, his body is perfect. Not his body. Well, it's like like a ham. His body is perfect, and I believe Mike is threatened by it. It makes him feel less <laughs> masculine. <laughs> and he's because his character is over the top, <laughs> And an aggressive sexual being. Oh, that he, first that first episode, that first by episode. the way. Oh God. I learned some moves. Anyway, <laughs> Ter <laughs> No, and Terran's actually very understated Put in this. Put it on the movie. poll, please, Roy, <laughs> at Lebitard Show. Have you, you have you learned some sexual moves watching uh television? So <laughs> Terran actually was in Rocket Man and he's uh He was great in Kingsman too. Like Kingsman, Kingsman, I, I loved him in yeah. Kingsman, but I don't know. He's in this movie Sing 2 that my daughter makes me watch all the time and she just plays a sky full of SARS covers that he does and it's just, I can't enough with this song already. So maybe that's part of what's happening right there. But I just think him to be too much. But I think he's perfect in this in this series. Very understated despite the, the, the constant James Dean scowl that he's going for. He is going for modern day James Dean. He's got the he's got the chin. Short, short King modern day James yeah. Dean. Who was well, probably I also a short king back in his day too. But he is a really short king. But he would make for an he'd make for a great impossible white man, right? In any of these movies, yeah, he, Kingsman, he is the impossible white man. And also, uh, as a Golden Cane, I saw that this was Ray Liotta's final uh, piece of work out there. And my wife loves Ray Liotta, so we got right into Blackbird. And my God, pa, this was a <laughs> tremendous experience. I'm halfway through the series. I'm at the edge of my seat. I love this show. The music in this show for '90s kids. It is pitch perfect. They do such a great job of building the tension. It is a slow burn. The pacing may not be everybody's favorite, but they tell parallel stories at a time, and you learn about this mystery surrounding this person, this, um, let's let's call him the baddie for the, the show. I'm halfway done, and I still don't know if he's bad or not. I kind of think he is, but I don't think he can be convicted, and that's what is at the crux of this series. I love it. And if this is a sign of what's to come for Apple, I think given what's happening with HBO Max and what's happening with Netflix, Apple may be the, the horse to bet on here. Mike, you know, this is a true story, right? Yeah. It's, well, it's, they remind you every every day. They do. But like, <laughs> I, I actually did a little cheating and went a little deeper in the Internet and started reading. Are you about finished with it yet? I've got like two episodes left. There's only six. It's six yeah, episodes. And I, I've only got the last one left. My my wife has seen the last one because I fell asleep and she didn't want to stop, but she was disappointed by the ending. Really? Yes. Uh, and, I, I, and and it matters on these things whether you nail the dismount or not. If you're if you're going to get the echo that you want in, in word of mouth. Let me warn you: if your father triggers you, if your father brings you shame, yeah. if your father does not make your life easier, if he's a show, dirty cop, this show is yeah. not for you. There are so many skin crawling moments involving Ray Liotta's character that I just feel, and it probably doesn't land like that on. Oh no, no, no. Well, it didn't land like that on 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 me, but I will say that I found myself moving away from the television to get away from Ray Liotta. So <laughs> it didn't land on me consciously like please examine your relationship with your father, but uh, as someone who did a TV show next to my dad for 8 years. But I did move away from the television set because Ray Liotta was not helpful while trying to love his son. But I was I'm not sure if my wife let me ask you guys this hypothetical as we have the larger conversation about how you're streaming. If you're five episodes through on six episodes and your wife tells you the sixth one is no good and your tastes run similar. Watch for yourself. I mean, you determine that, you know, I mean. 
I trust her judgment on this stuff, though. You're right, but watch I, it when she's not what, home. What, what I'm mean. what I'm telling you though is that I lost interest in it. I, I, you don't just leave one, that one episode laying out there. <laughs> I would have watched it already if she hadn't said, "Ah, it's not. It doesn't. It doesn't land." The same thing happened to me with Peaky Blinders. My wife is a huge fan of Peaky Blinders, and like the last episode of the last season, it's f- season finale, and there's nothing else, and you're waiting for Tommy to do something. And she's like, yeah, it was good. I wish I I wish I had more. So it took me like two months to see it because I was just like, meh, I'm good. I saw two episodes of this season of Peaky Blinders so far, and I kind of checked out on it. Now you got to keep going. I'll revisit. That's always my experience with Peaky Blinders. Always. I get frustrated because it's so slow. And then by the end of it, I'm like, this is one of the greatest shows ever. James Dean was 5'8". Short King. Jimmy Dean. One Speed Dean. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I that's wanna, an unfortunate oh, nickname. Right that's his nickname. It is unfortunate given the way that he died. I'm just telling you his nickname. That's all. Jimmy Dean, 5'8". I, I think you should apologize to James yeah. Dean. Sorry, James. And also apologize to the Cuban community in Miami yeah. for saying it that was Fidel a terrible Castro mistake. was the goat. Uh, I slept with it last night. Oh. I, I had a hard time sleeping. I had to be honest with you. I felt bad about it. I did. I was so hoping you'd About go, not listening. I, mean, I was I was so hoping you would have gone the other way on that. Like said, <laughs> oh, he is, Dan, of Caribbean dictators. You'll never find one that's finer, better than Batista. I was hoping that you'd go into Mel Kuyper. Yeah. Kuyper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I have to apologize for something that I said yesterday. I had assumed that John Leguizamo was Puerto Rican because he has told me he's Puerto Rican. But then I did some digging on the Internet afterwards. And this is apparently a big controversy for John Leguizamo, who was who was born in Colombia, has always maintained that he was Puerto Rican on his father's side. But his father himself has come (laughs) out and said that he's not Puerto Rican. So I'm not sure what's Uh, going on. Leguizamo still maintains Puerto Rican descent. I wanted to ask you, because HBO Max is making so many good things, I watched part of the first season of Gordita, uh, uh, Gordita Chronicles, and they canceled it as part right before everything with HBO Max shifted, in which if you like HBO, uh, your viewing habits are about to change if they're reportedly cutting 70% of their workforce but it felt like a uh, capasa usa campy to me it was a note off but it was even an, more than father of the bride uh well F- father of the bride is the most streamed movie in the history of hbo max because of how underserved the latin community is on some of this stuff it's a miami uh it's andy garcia and gloria stefan but Gord- gordito gordita chronicles um it felt campy on purpose, and it had some authentic Latin elements that I haven't seen on television since Que Pasa USA, like in 1980, where I recognized pieces and portions of my childhood in it. And if that's already, if that, if Latins are already underserved and under uh, underrepresented in streaming, what do you think is going to happen now when Netflix is cutting back and HBO Max is? getting out of the business this show reached latin people latin people liked it and now it's being discontinued after a a a season because uh that that market is a unicorn that all streaming services are trying to get to i think everybody is well within their rights to be deeply nervous and concerned because not anyone has anything bad to say about hbo max it's expensive maybe but everyone knows that it's got certified bangers on there and we're turning to discovery right now. I was so nervous about it. And then I saw their presentation in which they, they dubbed the 90 day fiance show as a show worthy of having its own universe. And they classified shows uh, that are in their locker and 90 day fiance was held in higher regard than the Sopranos and curb your enthusiasm. I was, I was deeply concerned by all of this. But- 90 Day Fiance does have a bigger audience than The Sopranos. Well, maybe not The Sopranos now, or maybe not The Sopranos then, but certainly The Sopranos now. And Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's the unfortunate truth. I find fascinating. We have CNBC on here in the studio, and they did a whole segment yesterday on the business of streaming. Ultimately, this has been a bubble. It's a bubble that we as consumers have gotten to enjoy. But basically, it has been a race to credit cards that renew once a month, right? Who is going to get your credit card that renews once a month? And I think now a lot of companies are kind of realizing at a certain certain point, we have to turn a profit on this stuff and we haven't. And so real genuine business decisions are being made. And that's at, to the, that's at the cost of the consumer because the tens of billions of dollars being pumped into content was always wildly unsustainable. We've just gotten to enjoy it. And now it's going to become a proper business and things will be sacrificed as a result. 
Mike Schur is going to be on with us here uh, to do a stat of the day. And he just had a project and it was heartbreaking. That Field of Dreams project, he's a baseball guy. They had gotten deep into spending on, you know, a lot of money. Baseball field in Iowa to do a television project that represents his nice uh, next work at a company that has been great to him and he's been great to that company for 25 years. And they realized that whatever the rest of the budget was, no, we could just cut it off, just stop it, kill it right here, and we save X number of millions of dollars. And then all the work just disappears. It just vanishes. And so when you say that you're worried about some of this stuff, I was talking to Barkley some off air and he really wrestled, really wrestled with what to do. And it was, it was f fascinating to see what was happening because Charles Barkley is at TNT. They too have been bought. And so it's different work experience. Like it was for us at Disney, it became a different work experience and he's going to retire soon. And the idea of being able to get into his sixties, a giant paycheck where he can help black colleges and use some of that money, uh, but throw away everything he's been for 40 years. You're not a sellout. You, we like you. We, Barkley gives up everything, endorsements, everything. I thought that he could have, by just publicly saying that he wouldn't take these millions of dollars because it was, what was it, 700, 800 million for Tiger Woods, to God? Yes, like, right. Well, so, a billion, some people reported. Yeah. The to, to trade in at 60 years old, the parachute of like, hey, it's just Saudi money. But he's been on television, Barkley, for 40 years. He still gets to host Saturday Night Live. His career is one of the most amazing things you will ever see. From, from guy who was polarizing to guy who gets to be liked the rest of his life as an outspoken black man. That just never happens. No. And he would have been trading it. And I thought, you tell me whether you think I'm right or wrong about this. That if he says I'm staying at TNT, which has changed ownerships, and you're going to see content changes everywhere as people who don't do content start running content. When you've been with these, he, he was under stress. I never think of Charles Barkley as ever under stress. Anything related to Charles Barkley is never stressful. He was stressed by what was happening because he understood that there would be a trade being made on everything he's been with the American public if he made that decision to just cash out on everything he's been. My my whole problem with Liv from the get-go is I don't understand why people care more about Charles Barkley than the U.S. completing a $3 billion weapons deal with Saudi Arabia last week. I don't for the people life care of me. about that I, too, I cannot make... Phil Mickelson, the avatar for my geopolitical relations with Saudi Arabia. I just cannot. Like, if you're going to get mad in this country, be Team PGA about Phil Mickelson, take a look around. Like, you keep your eye on the ball. But it is would, not about Phil Mickelson or Charles Barkley. But just so you know, though, he would have lost. He would have. He couldn't do both. And he would have lost his sponsors. Right. He would have lost, uh, he makes, uh, I think he's told people this publicly, uh, that he, he makes $20 million a year, mm -hmm. and half of it is salary, and half of it is sponsors. He would have lost his sponsors. To All of them, though? Every sponsor? Because I think some sponsors have stayed with guys like Dustin Johnson. Some of them have, right? Like Barkley... He still would have been beloved enough where some of those sponsors I don't, maybe I don't stay know. with he, him. He thought it was an either-or choice. So I don't know. Okay. And if that's the either or choice, Mike, it's not quite. Yes, you can talk about all of these conundrums everywhere, but it's rarely as obvious as this is where you've got someone using golf, the country club sport. It's not teammates. It's not commitment to team. It's individuals. It's ripe. It is so vulnerable for, oh, we'll just drug. We'll we'll launder our money over here. We'll grab Greg Norman. They're all individual corporations. It's easier to do. I don't need teams. I don't need, I don't need regional identities. I just grab dudes by, by paying this tax, this tax of how many more millions can I give you to soil your, your name in the spirit of perhaps people like Mike will get weary of the principal. I mean, you you, you got mad at Aaron Rodgers yeah. at, at the, at the, the choice. But I still that, watch Aaron Rodgers. I still love watching Aaron Rodgers play. I, 
I have not watched Live Golf yet. I've seen some clips on social media. The screen kind of bothers me. I don't understand what we're doing with these horrific logos. And I don't like that they have diluted the PGA tournaments because I just like seeing the best golfers play. I am also not boycotting Live Golf. If they have something worth watching, I might be curious if they change up their presentation and make it more uh, agreeable with my palate, I may give it a shot. I'm not going to make a big political stance over golf, for Christ's sakes. I, I just find it exhausting. Would I do it if I were in their shoes? Absolutely not. But I'm not going to judge them any further than I already have. I'm not going to rob myself of the enjoyment, possibly, of one day being able to watch high-level golf, just like I judge Aaron Rodgers and I still enjoy it. And they are not, by the way, in any realm the same thing. Aaron Rodgers is, I was harder on Aaron Rodgers than I've been on the Saudi government just because it was a topic du jour. And if I come across that way, crush me for that hypocrisy because no, not at all. Aaron, my problems with you are very minor. I you need, can send that to Tom Fan. I need something nice. I do. He <laughs> hasn't responded yet. That's a good I'm a little one, though. That's a good clip, no, though. That's it, a good no, clip. No, it's not good enough. I, my, no. my, but he wasn't good enough? Look, no. I think if it's well, the well, most... Aaron Rodgers, look, 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 oh, okay. look me in the eye. Aaron Rodgers yeah. is way better than the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I've said it. I've said it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I need yes, more. I hold yeah. him in way higher regard. I, I, I think the, yeah. the quote on the movie poster that you said to Tom Fanning to see if we can mm -hmm. uh, look even more pathetic, begging for Aaron Rodgers to come on with <laughs> us, is Aaron Rodgers, my issues with you are very small. Very Aaron minor. Rodgers, <laughs> very minor. My issues with you are very, very minor. <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, look, Sukat's informed everybody that the world is spinning faster. Got more of a problem with that than I do with you. <laughs> Just had our shortest day ever. I mean, anyone concerned about that? Anybody? Yeah. Anyone keeping track of this? I am I mean, concerned that yeah. Earth is like, all right, let's speed this thing up already. Let's get this let's thing get over to the with. End. <laughs> You mentioned uh, being more agreeable to your palate, and I thought Tony had uh, a decent list he was assembling back there because he is, and I don't know the food that he was speaking of, but he wanted to do a table or make a table for, see if I have this right, things that smell wonderful, but then disappoint you when you eat them because you thought that the smell uh, was going to make it extra delicious. Hmm. Oh. So, Dan, I was at Epcot over the weekend drinking around the world, and uh, we're getting to the part in the bend at Epcot where you go from Italy to America, and you start walking by and you start smelling something. You're like, what's that smell? It smells delicious. Oh, my God. And then you realize what it is. It's the turkey leg stand. The oh. Disney turkey leg yep. smells so much better than it tastes. Yeah. Because when you get it in your hand, one, man. you it's take a, a bite one. and you're like, yeah. oh, I got to finish this whole thing. I just paid $25 for this. It's salty. It's, it's giant. Good. It's greasy. There's a vein in my mouth. Like, why is there a vein here? It's like, and uh, you're working. It's hard work to eat that turkey leg. Too. You're not even sure if it's turkey. It might be emu. I don't know. This is going Ooh, to be emu. hard to top because he is so right about this. Turkey smells delicious. But there is there is actually something deeply disgusting about what I just realized for the first time. I you have lifted the scales from my eyes, which is Disney's been suckering me for years with that smell, and all they're giving me is basically the limb of a giant bird being cooked. I don't know how, <laughs> being treated. I don't know how on what farm. And now I'm walking around, and this is the most primitive thing in the world. When that little kid's got a $25 balloon. That little kid's got a $25 cotton candy. And I, caveman for the ages, am holding a giant limb of a bird that is disgusting. <laughs> and I'm walking around with it. No, you didn't do me the courtesy of throwing a garnish on there. There's no bread to be found. Right. It's just me, the grease. <laughs> There's nothing. You made no effort to do anything other than sever a bird's leg and throw it in the fryer. And it is so hot at Epcot. The sun is beaming down. And you're on the face of the sun. It's, it's salty. 9,000 degrees and you're eating this hot chicken leg. Who's going to beat this? I mean, the, the, the turkey leg. Do you, do you disagree generally with the turkey leg? Like, do you pull a turkey leg at Thanksgiving? No, I never do. The turkey really? leg to me wow. is the worst part of the leg because, or the worst part of the turkey, because there's like muscles and like bones that are there yeah. that you don't Tendons. really realize are there. Yeah. And you're like, oh, what? like, yeah, like, oh, you, like you, a, you pick a little small bone out of your teeth. It's like, a little too it? much it's, of a reminder that you're eating an animal. Yeah, yeah it's very yeah. shardy. Yeah. It's like, it has shards. Yeah. I have something else though. Usually holding up a, a meaty leg does that. When you go to the heat games and you're walking by the concourse and you start, you're like, 
What is that? That smells delicious. It's those like cinnamon or honey oh, almonds or peanuts or whatever. Yeah. So Miami almonds. They taste Terrible. like shit. Really? They're so oh, bad. They, they smell so they great. great though. Without, yeah. further, without further ado, not, wow. not crunchy Top enough. five great smelling foods that underwhelm oh, once wow. you taste them. Wow. Here we go. Right. Inspired by Tony Hold on, Sobic. I write this down. Before, Number five. <laughs> Hold on. Before we get to that, I simply want to know, Roy. Man. We Roy uh, objected to Tony never having a turkey leg. Is that uh, at Thanksgiving? Is that what you were objecting to? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Like because he what? He blasphemed against you? Or yeah, that's... yes, yes. I'm a I'm... breast guy. <laughs> Abba, Abba. Mm. Number five. <laughs> Number five. Good Tony, leg, you're on it. <laughs> Number five is hot nuts. Yeah, hot nuts. Oh, I love hot nuts. Hot nuts. I'm not saying nuts. that they're bad. This is going to be a very controversial list because I'm not telling you that these foods are bad. I'm just telling you that they're not nearly as good tasting as they smell. Subjective. Right. They set very high expectations with their intoxicating yeah. smell. Underworld. Right. <laughs> and number four, this one's easy. Because there isn't a single goddamn time I'm at a restaurant when someone orders a fajitas that I don't go, damn, Whoa. I should have ordered Whoa. the fajitas. Yeah. The great taste. You're saying it underwhelmed? Wait yeah. a minute. No, 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 this I'm, not telling you that fa- I'm not telling you that fajitas are bad. Yeah. I'm just telling you that they pale in comparison to the uh, aromatic experience. I, I am going to need you, okay, to back off and understand. This is where you want him to back off, not Aaron Rodgers? This is why I want him to back off, because his expertise here cannot and will not be mine. I love fajitas. You but, do not dabble in Mexican the way that I do. And what I am telling you is the fajita done well at the correct place, delivered properly. You go from your expectations getting very high to them exceeded by a well-made fajita. You're eating crap somewhere. I do dabble in Mexican as much, if not more than you, Dan Lebitard. Whoa! And let me tell you something. Every time I order the sizzling hot fajitas uh-huh. that come to my table, I do enjoy them. But I never enjoy them more than I wish that I had ordered them exactly. when I'm sitting at another table and then order the burrito grande <laughs> and uh, someone has the fajitas. The I'm like, God damn it! Oh, yeah. I should have had the fajitas. <laughs> yeah. right, right, that right, 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 the grande is yeah. good. Though. No, the burrito. Yeah. And, and if I'm at ordering the ceviche, I'm like, in the moment, I know that this tastes better than the fajitas. But for that moment that it comes out sizzling and I smell nothing, it, I'm nothing like, oh, beats God, it. Nothing beats it. I, I, I withdraw my objection. You've it's made a fair. sound and coach the argument. Oh really did. no! I'm no, going to piss you off. We're only at four. Right. This is oh. going to piss you Roy. off because oh these are great smelling foods at Underwell compared to the smell. But just so we're clear, you do like fajitas. Love fajitas. Okay. Every type. Fajita. Meat, Roy. meat, chicken, vegetable yeah. fajitas, even Scott fajitas. My... <laughs> oh, the sword has been laid down. Oh, no. <laughs> the great gunner. I mean. <laughs> Yes, Dan. Why? Why did uh, Scott Fajita just and deliver? Auntie, Dan, we're talking Fajitas. <laughs> I mean, um, Roy, <laughs> excellent call. Can Good you job. put on the poll, please, at Lebitard Show, the fajita that's sizzling toward your t- toward your table? Does it exceed expectations in taste, or does it disappoint you? It can only disappoint. It doesn't matter how bomb ass those fajitas are. It doesn't matter how fat your fajitas are. If they come to your table, they're not going to taste as good as they look like they're going to taste. There is nothing like the feeling of you feel like your fajitas have finally arrived. You hear that unmistakable hear it. It's smell. coming. It's Everyone here. It's coming. It's, it's coming. Everyone. You smell <laughs> the aromatic yeah. experience Everyone. is wonderful. You can tell all the dads in the, the restaurant start turning. <laughs> right. And then at the last, the waiter turns the other way. <laughs> for like, someone no, else. No, yes. No, yes. you go? Yeah. I should have yeah. had you yeah. go. Yeah. Let's, uh, I, there is no food quite like this because now we've realized that for for – for men whose greatest pleasure, because you've left behind all the other pleasures, you're now a dad who secures the perimeter. This is champagne bottles with sparklers in your past. 
<laughs> fajitas. It's a plate this, of fajitas. This is for, for dads. For dads. <laughs> <laughs> because Mike said, as this tray comes out and it's sizzling, and now it's a lit fuse. And you know what it attracts? Dads. Dads sit up in their booths. That sound is a siren's call. Everybody corrects their posture when the feet. Well, every yeah. dad in the building has perfect posture right. when the fajitas <laughs> come out. You forgot that this place even Maybe. ordered fajitas, and then the sizzle right. reminds you, why didn't I order the fajita? Right. Oh. But the reason why I didn't order the fajitas is when I finally ordered the fajitas, it underwhelmed. And I remember that. But every damn time that thing comes out there, I'm like, God damn it, I should have ordered the fajitas. Put that on the poll as well, Roy. Should you have ordered the fajitas? Mm -hmm. Scott Fajita. God damn it. <laughs> Number three. Oof, this is a, a hot list right now. You know when you got a good one. Yeah. Number three. Popcorn. No! Oh, that's a good one. It's a good one. No! Popcorn what? smells right. terrific. Yep. Yes. And it never tastes as good as it smells. Uh. All right, I'm going to have to bring, make my popcorn. I'm gonna Your popcorn to is Oh, you have great. a special brand of popcorn? Oh, yeah, his does, popcorn his popcorn's among the best popcorn. popcorn I've ever had, and it doesn't taste as good as it smells. <laughs> wow. That's what this list is. It's a good one. I'm putting very good dishes on this list, guys, but they underwhelm compared to the smells. Yeah. This is so, the harsh reality of popcorn. So you eat popcorn at a movie theater, and you go, mm, I don't yeah. eat popcorn in a movie theater. No, nah, too expensive. What? No, too expensive, number one. Roy, bang on. And also, I don't trust their popcorn. Mm. What do you mean you don't mm -hmm. trust the I don't it? trust a food that is transported in garbage bags. They're telling you right what they think of it. They're but, telling you right there. But what if they get it out of the thing? No. That thing, the it's, communal thing? No, thank you. It's the most effective vessel. No. No. Just because it's a garbage can no. does not mean <laughs> that it is like <laughs> covered in this. How many filth. times let me ask you, how many times do you think they clean the popcorn machine? At a movie theater. Probably not very often. That thing has oil in it from like the Independence Day opening. But Mike, do you, do you think- <laughs> there, is, there are kernels of corn at the bottom of that popcorn maker that were there for the Nutty Professor premiere. <laughs> the first Bush administration. But you have no Mike, idea how old the kernels of popcorn you were having at a movie theater. Independence Day was made in 96, Mike, I mean. How, how much do you think that any food that is served to you is well prepared on- in, At in a movie theater? Kitchens? Very little. I know, but but like anywhere at any restaurant, you eat filthy shit all the time. Come on, what no, are you doing? No, no, no. What but are you doing? no, no. Trust me. Do what are you no. doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Let me enjoy my dinner. Jesus. When, when I order the skittles, the what are you doing this to me? When I order the He's skittles, I can right. tell from the well, packaging and uh, expiring yeah. dates that it's not a skittle that was there for Mrs. Doubtfire. Oh, come on. Roy, put these on the poll, please. Do you trust movie theater popcorn? I've got a number of these, so get ready. It's many of them. Do you trust any food delivered in garbage bags? This is a third poll question. What if they get it out of that thing? <laughs> Tony, I guess you meant the the the, the popcorn machine. Whatever, we all know what, what he meant. Whatever that, that is did. called, that yeah, thing. Yeah, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah. Uh, do they clean the movie theater popcorn thing? And finally, do you eat filthy shit all the time? Ah. <laughs> you do. I didn't Every, like that. Everything is dirty. Just if, knock it up. We know. No. Okay. We got it. We I don't need filthy. No, I think yeah. most people just, they know, they store it in the back of their minds. They don't need to be reminded that, hey, when I go out for dinner, I'm eating a bunch of filth. Okay. Let me enjoy my dinner. Let me enjoy my filth. <laughs> <Right. laughs> That's <laughs> God's tombstone. <laughs> Making a cleanliness <laughs> argument against popcorn does not make any sense to me. I didn't think that we would be pulling the knives out for this top five list. It's got everybody. <laughs> The, the movie theater popcorn yet. is the best smelling of the popcorns, correct? We're in agreement that the movie theater popcorn, the, yes. everything else, it's so salty, it's so rich, it's so buttered, because what the smell is. Just, and then you oh, have the extra fake butter on the side. Yeah, 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 you ever do the yeah, thing yeah, where you eat, like, yeah, yeah, you eat like the, yeah, first, yeah. the first third before the trailers are done, and then right before the trailers finish, you go back outside, apply a second layer of the butter Buddy, topping. Yeah, I got something that's going to change your life. Mm. Are you ready? What you do is you go to that motor oil machine that they have there. Yep. And then you actually get a straw and put it in the spigot of the butter machine. Whoa. You put it inside your <laughs> popcorn. Oh, dear you God. start pouring it and then you slowly move it down and then it butters all Whoa. the way around. Oh, wow. my God. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Goodness. If I were to yeah. ever eat popcorn at a movie theater, I might try that. But I would never because rats bathe in it. Number thing, right? <laughs> they do. 
Ask him. Ask him. Look it up. Put it, uh, Ask him. Uh, Rats uh, bathe in those Roy, things. Put it, put it on the poll. Is the bag of movie theater popcorn a bubble bath for rats? <laughs> Number two. Oh, wow. Number oh, two. It's a good something, last, Mike. Something that I really enjoy. It's good. We can all admit that it's really good, but it doesn't taste as good as it smells. Number two is coffee. Ah, mm. oh, waking up. The best part of waking up <laughs> is Folgers in your cup, yeah, but not in your mouth. Fresh pot. Especially the way that I take it when I'm IFing, it's just black. So my coffee experience has been really diluted lately because I'm just doing it so I can wake up and take a shit. <laughs> with mixed results this is why uh you're securing the perimeter and you are fighting off uh the vagaries of aging at every turn will you do the same though if you get through like the first half hour 45 minutes an hour of your day without pooping will you go for the coffee because i do and i'm just drinking the coffee just the poop that in a heater i mean it works every the time the heaters work yeah. for pooping i don't understand yeah. how that works you want to join me for one no diuretic how yeah. often do you smoke a cigarette on the toilet like when's the last time oh i haven't done that I mean, since last week i mean <laughs> number one number one this is going to be so controversial uh, because it tastes great turkey leg isn't even on there. It's not it, turkey leg's not on there it tastes great oh, well, I... but it doesn't taste as good as it smells and i can't even look at you guys in the eyes but number one for the price and everything it's truffle Oh, wow. the price. Oh, oh come wait, on, the man. price. You oh, throw in the on, price, man. though. Come truffle on, come on. Price, I, I love truffle. Fries. Mike, truffle fries. I always order the truffle. Oh, come on, Mike. I always want come them on, to Mike. shave it on Mike. there as if it were Parmesan cheese and I'm at the macaroni grill. Mm. I spend so much money on truffle. I always accept the upcharge on truffle. It's like the guac at Chipotle. I got to have it. But it doesn't taste as good as it smells. It just doesn't. You want it to taste like it smells, and it doesn't. You know I'm telling the truth. And hurts. that's why it's number one, because it's heart. so expensive. All right, we're going to go to Mike Schur's stat of the day here, but he's picking up the last part of this conversation and just get his opinion on it. Tell him what it is that you've told the group. You throw in price on truffle. Truffle is expensive. Part of the experience. I would, that's what helps make something overrated. All right. Uh, you want to Timmy give, Tuffle. Go ahead and uh, Timmy Tuffle. I mean, you know, truffle. Timmy Truffle. I mean, Scott Vegeta. <laughs> <laughs> What are you doing? You've never know. heard of Tim Tuffle, uh, a great uh, utility uh, infielder for the New York Mets back in the I 80s mean, and great, 90s. Great is overstated. Uh, he was fantastic, yep. Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you be a great utility player? Lenny Harris. Like, of course you can. Yeah, well, I think like in the grand scheme of things, Mike, you're great at being a utility player. The goat of utility players? Like Jose Alfredo Mezica was a great utility Mezzi. player, but he wasn't great. Jose Okendo is one of the great utility players of all time. I don't want to hear about it. That's not true in, it it, in any way. So okay. Mike, Mike Schur is going to give us a stat of the day in a second. But Mike Ryan has put together his top five list of uh, foods that smell great coming out, but don't taste as great as the smell. What would be the number one off the top of your head, Mike? Uh that's tough. Um, so they, these are overrated foods that are overrated based on how they smell, not and that they don't taste as well as they smell. Is right. that correct? Right. Yeah. But the 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 trick here is they can still taste amazing, but they just underwhelm compared to how great they smell. Yeah, you guys talked about this recently. I'm in New York City now, and the the hot roasted nuts on the side of the street yep. in New York is yes. one. Yes, it's a fine. Uh, that was choice. number, that was five, number five, five on his list. A yeah. fine choice. That's why I write these things down. I I love coffee, but I think coffee smells a good. It's deal also better. on the Number list. Two. Nice. Again, Let's say you're doing very well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I would say um, uh, uh, I don't know. I I I feel like no. The, you guys are not going to agree with this, but I think sometimes fresh baked bread smells better than it tastes it was all alive wow. toast toast was all yeah, alive toast. Uh, toast i'll have but fresh baked bread <laughs> no it's delicious yeah i'm not saying it's not delicious i'm saying that the smell is like sends you into a fit of rapture and the taste is excellent but not quite as maybe good as it thank suggested you. thank you mike I don't these know, guys keep the... falling for that trap we're not saying yeah. it's bad we're saying <laughs> right. it. we're, well, we're truffle, actually saying it's quite good how about the fudge from Kilwins? mike um, oh mike wow. ryan put uh, mike ryan put number one the truffle 
That's insane. Truffle doesn't have any smell that I can remember or identify. Oh, what? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Smell. It, it it's, it's, not a, it's not an aroma. It's not an, like, an aroma that fills a room the way that coffee is. Truffle, no, is, I would say, is, is, but I agree, Mike, truffle really. is 95% aroma. <laughs> but if you're near it, yes. But it, it doesn't, like, you ha- you're saying you have to, like, get close to it and smell it and then put it on your whatever. Your you're going to the wrong truffle joint. Pasta. I'm not going to any truffle joint. <laughs> Truffle fries uh, taste every bit as good as they smell. I don't think so, man. I, I, I mean, I'm with you that truffles are overrated because every time you eat truffle fries, they cost like thirty eight dollars, and then you're like, these are just worse fries. These are just fries with salt and then another thing that I don't want. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and do stat of the day here. You tell me Ben Call, Zobrist wasn't calling, any good. Calling <laughs> us from I didn't say he wasn't any good. I said he's not great. <laughs> But- <laughs> start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Start of the day, start of the day, it is the start of the day. Yes, Mike. Aren't you supposed to tell me that it's brought to me by something? Uh, not every time, but it is brought to you by Zip Recruiter. Zip Recruiter, the smartest way to hire. Folks, yesterday on the show, uh, Stu Gatt seemed to realize for the first time that the Mets are good. <laughs> and a huge part of that reason for that is that uh, their closer, Edwin Diaz, is having an insane year. He has 91 strikeouts in just over 45 innings, almost exactly two strikeouts per inning. Now, I know he's a closer and he's not a starter. However, to put his K rate into perspective, if he threw the same number of innings Nolan Ryan threw in 1974, Edwin Diaz would finish the year with about 665 strikeouts. (laughs) If he threw the same number of innings as Kid Gleason from 1893, Diaz would have 761 strikeouts. If he threw the same number of innings as Pretzel's Getzian from 1888. That's right. Pretzel's Getzian. The pretzel. Uh, pretzels were Diaz, all lie. Diaz would have 808 strikeouts. And now I know what you're thinking, Dan. What if Edwin Diaz threw the same number of innings that Pud Galvin did in 1883? Well, uh, that's what I was yeah. thinking. In that case, Edwin Diaz would finish the year with more than 1,313 strikeouts. I think you made up Pud Galvin. Look it up, baby. That a boy. A lot of guys in that era named Heine, as I recall. A lot of yeah, uh, the, a lot the, of Heine minutiae, <laughs> and there's a lot of the, there's a lot of kids. There's a lot of like kid kid Johnson and stuff like that. But there is a real guy named Pretzels Getzy in an 1888, and he threw 404 innings in a single year. <laughs> See you later, Mike. Bye. I was really hoping that on the retirement of Serena Williams, who you can give goat status to, even as we agreed (laughs) yesterday, that there are too many goats out there and you're giving it away too freely and we've got to knock it off. You're allowing this one? Well, she we can describe her as goat without dilution or reservation. I was hoping that we'd start here with Ron McGill asking uh, questions about ridiculousness about actual goats about actual goats Mm -hmm. correct but because i wanted to talk about serena williams and because howard bryant knows tennis uh i can say this more than anybody i know howard bryant knows tennis i want to talk to him about this so that he can put it in perspective for us but mike ryan has been distracted by something that will also titillate howard bryant because we were talking about edwin diaz's entrance for the mets and how great the music is. And you're old enough to remember Lee Smith's saunter and a bunch of other things that came out of the bullpen that were the coolest. But Mike Ryan has back there. He just happened upon something, the Vince Scully call of the Kirk Gibson home run. So I I started looking up Dennis Eckersley entrance theme and he came out to George Thurgood's bad to the bone. And I uh, remember that I actually recently watched a Dennis Eckersley game because of the passing of in Scully, ESPN played that game in full. The the uh, the Oakland A's LA Dodgers World Series game that Kirk Gibson heroically comes on to pinch hit and does like the lawnmower yes thing. I watched most of that broadcast 
And uh, that was a really hysterical part of that broadcast, by the way, that I couldn't believe didn't get seized on by Twitter in which they're talking about Jose Canseco and steroid allegations from other people around baseball. And there is canned video of him pregame talking to the reporters so upset that he even has to deal with it, dismissing <laughs> it out of hand. How could you allege this stuff? Not true <laughs> whatsoever. Vince Scully called that game so beautifully as he did everything. And I really hope if anything, with it becoming a viral thing and him trending on Twitter, people could dip back into some of his great calls because he is, quite frankly, the greatest to ever do. How did you like Jose Canseco the way that he swung in that series? I could not believe. And I remember Jose Canseco playing baseball, especially like older, even bigger Jose Canseco having monster seasons with the Rays and Blue Jays inexplicably, or so we thought. I have never in my life seen a more powerful swing he struck out <laughs> sheffield i have no. he swung wow. out of his no, he was shoes. crazy anyways howard let's get you in here I, what is the coolest entrance you've covered baseball in new york for a long time uh is is edwin diaz entering the conversation with some of these other enter sandman mario rivera and some of the coolest things that come out of a bullpen Okay, so I am covering the Oakland A's in 1999. I'm my second year in the beat. I'm walking uh, on the uh, around the grounds with Billy Bean, the general manager, and he looks at me and he says, Alex Rodriguez is the greatest shortstop in the history of the game right now. And I said, he's in his third season. And he said, doesn't matter. Therefore, along those lines, this is the greatest entrance of all time right now. Better than all of them. Whoa. When you come Howard, stop Whoa. it. Do it in the postseason, Howard. I know. Listen, when you come into trumpets, show me somebody else. There's only one thing I thought of, and that was Julio Cesar Chavez getting ready for a fight listening to, like, the Mexican National Anthem. I mean, you got to throw down when you're that. When you, no. when you come into trumpets, you are ready to throw down. Now, is he going to be good enough in the playoffs and the rest of Thank it to you. trumpets? But goodness, if you come into trumpets, show me somebody else. Oh, who I will. To, I, to do I, that. Howard, you're off base. It's not even the best trumpet entrance. I pose to you, John <laughs> Cena. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll take baseball. Maybe oh, somebody else. Oh, baseball. On. You're changing I mean, the rules. You go boxing. Now it's just exclusive to baseball. John oh, no, Cena you, is the best trumpet entrance, da, 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 period. Da, 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 da. <laughs> He's been badgered into submission. Um, I, I want to talk to him about what's going on too in, uh, in with HBO Max and the and the Marvel universe and everything that's happening there. But before we do any more of that, you saw Will Smith and everything that happened around what was supposed to be the graceful coronation of Serena Williams in film, and you now see in Vogue magazine she is announcing her retirement, U.S. Open. You explain it to some to somebody who you are someone who really loves tennis. What what is retiring right now? Well, I mean, you're watching. I mean, you can make if you want to do the whole historical goats, and there are a lot of there are a lot of goats out there. But I mean, to me, for the last ten years, you're looking at the signature face of the sport, and at least, especially in the women's game, but maybe in both. I mean, obviously, you've got the big three on the other side, but. There's, you really haven't seen that level of singular dominance. Um, everybody else has had rivals. Steffi Graf had rivals, even though she's got 22 majors. You know, Martina and Chrissy did their thing. They've got rivals, you know, the bird and magic thing. But Serena just stomped everybody. I mean, really, when you're looking at that sort of singular dominance, if somebody coming in, 2012 French Open, she goes in, she loses to Ginny Rosano and the first round and people are like, Oh my God, she's done. And then she absolutely demolishes the field for the next eight years. And it's just, it's, it's unprecedented in a lot of ways, especially in the open era where you're supposed to compete with a lot of other great players, like everybody else has. And she just, you know, not only did she separate herself on the court, but this is one of the things that I had real issues with, even though I know you guys are really big football guys. I hate parody. I really don't like parody. I'm not here for parody. I'm here for dominance. I'm not here for your eight and eight bullshit where, you know, everybody gets a chance to make the playoffs every five years. Give me the best. Serena walked out there and she whooped ass on everybody, you know, and that 
to me is what it's all about. I want to see somebody come out there and face down everybody, every challenge, every time. And even when they lose, there's something powerful about, about the loss. And Serena, not having Serena on the stage is really going to diminish. I know we're talking about Naomi Osaka and we're talking about, you know, Bianca and Driscu and talking about Iga Srontek and the rest of them. It's Serena Williams' game and it's going to be a long time before somebody else really steps in. She's got 23 majors. Osaka's got four. And people were trying to talk about Osaka as, as some sort of heir to the throne. I mean, she's the best. And that's why we're here to watch. That's what I want to watch. You know sports excellence. You also know sports toughness. You know the belly of the beast. You know how grueling some of this stuff is. Place in a context for us the understanding of her longevity in that sport that eats its young and is uh, really feels abusive to me to uh, in terms of stealing childhoods. You can you can say is abusive. <laughs> I mean, the you know Serena Williams didn't even go to school. I mean, she was essentially homeschooled and she was went to she went to classes on the tennis court. So you want to talk about taking everything? All I'm going to say to you about Serena Williams when it comes to that question, Dan, she went pro in '95. It was 27 years ago. I mean, she's been a professional athlete since 1995, and her sister Venus went pro the year before '94. So she's been on the main stage for 27 years. And when you think about it, she's been a pro longer than her rivals right now have been alive. And that is something that you don't really get in a lot of sports. Maybe periodically you'll get a Tom Brady or somebody like that, but it's really, or Nolan Ryan, it's really, really hard to do. And to do it in that sport. And that sport, and this is also, Serena is one of the first members of this new generation where you can continue to win in your 30s. Most players are out of there by their mid-20s. The game just burns them out. We just saw Ashley Barty retire. She's not even 30. And we're seeing it everywhere. But Serena, the the toughness, the, the it's not just the toughness, it's the desire to continue to compete when in that sport, you don't have teammates. You don't have really coaching. You don't have timeouts. The mental brain power of trying to play that sport where eventually most players, most people are like, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. And for her to compete, uh, you know, in her in, in her retirement piece, in, the, in the, the Vogue story, she talked about how she tried to turn all the negativity into a positive where she could hear somebody in the crowd saying something some nobody in the crowd and that would like fuel her to try to like do better or to to dominate and crush her opponents or whatever. But that level of competitiveness, it's going to be really interesting to see how she transitions because most players who have that, the Jeters, the Jordans, the Larry Birds, they don't transition very well because nothing can replace that. Nothing else out there can duplicate what she's about to leave. So interested in seeing what she does next. Howard, Mike and I love tennis as well. And I understand what you're saying. I love dominance. Uh, Mike and I really do love tennis. We love the sport. We love the history of the sport. And I get what you're saying about having a dominant player in that sport. But there's always someone next. Like we said the same thing when Martina left and then Serena and uh, Venus came along. We said the same thing about when Sampras left and then Federer came and then Federer kind of faded out and it was Novak Djokovic. Jack left. Tiger replaced him. Like there's always going to be someone next, right? Yeah, there's always going to be someone next. However, I will make an argument here. and, and, And I'm interested in your thoughts on this. It is harder to be a great player than ever today. Harder than ever. And the reason is, is because of you. you know, <laughs> the reason is because of us. The reason it's your fault. The reason is because today you get the attention of a champion. You get the money of a champion. You get the visibility and the endorsements of a champion without having to be a champion. You can make a ton of money in sports today and not win anything. You're right. You know, you can walk out of there. You know, Osaka's making $50 million a year. She's got four majors. Back then... Those guys had to win to earn. You don't have to win to earn today. So I'm really looking forward. Obviously, yes, there are going to be tons of great players coming. There's always somebody next to them. You think you've never, you're never going to see this again. Somebody comes because that's what happens. But the way that sports is set up today, you can check out of this real fast and make a boatload 
before you're competing. You're, it's going to take that special person who has decided that they're going to compete against history instead of just playing for, you know, playing for money or playing for attention. You're going to get all of that. You can get all of that without even winning a major, never mind 23 of them. But it can't be disproven what you guys are saying that someone always comes next. And I can argue, not like this, longer career than Tom Brady out of Compton, revolutionizing the sport, overwhelming body, staying with her for 30 years. Like, no, nah, man, yeah. we ain't yeah. going to see this again. This, uh, Like, you could go ahead and think that maybe you'll see it, but not like this. Not hey, If you're going to give everyone $50 million a year and they don't have to win, people are going to gravitate toward the, the empire that she built. Oh. That's 100%. And also, if you're going to add Venus in there as well, they are. You can throw Eli and Peyton in there. You can throw, you know, if you want to throw Randy Moff and Billie Jean King in there, be my guest. You can throw the Boone family, whoever you want. Or Venus and Serena are the greatest pair of siblings in the history of North American sports. And nobody's done what they did. No one's going to do what they've done, you know? I mean, and so you're right in terms of you think you're going to, you're going to see greatness, but you're not going to see that again in my opinion. Howard, uh, you got me thinking because I too actually like dominance and you held up the NFL as an example. I'd tell you that you actually see dominance in the NFL. It's the same guy, much like Serena <laughs> doing it over the course of, <laughs> uh, of 20 years. But in, in men's tennis, we see dominance and it's dispersed almost evenly throughout three guys, their rivals. We know that when we get to a final, we are going to see two at the absolute height of this sport with Serena I have a hard time trying to even figure out who her greatest rival is. Is it, it was Venus? Venus? No, it, it's it Venus. If you look yeah. at the records, Jankovic probably had the best record against her. It was only a 40% success rate. So who was her greatest rival? Her greatest rival was her sister. It's Venus. You got to go back 20 years, but it's those two. You go back to what they were doing in the early 2000s and the late 90s. They dominated the sport. They were, one, they were both number, number one and number two. The number of, I mean... You could make, an, I mean, Venus has got seven majors. If it weren't for Serena, they would be like Chrissy and Martina. They'd be like 16 apiece or whatever. But you're looking at, you're looking at the way that those two had to push each other. You're looking at the way that those two, the, and those matches were not always great matches because there was so much emotion in the, in, you know, between them. How do you, how do you play your sister in a major in front of 24,000 people? And so there's no doubt if you go back to the, to the more recent times, the last decade, for me, it's probably Azarenka, those back-to-back -back U.S. Open finals in 20, 2013, 2014, 2012, 2013. I don't remember those two. Um, you know, but really, she did not have a singular rival. What she did have, however, what was really sort of interesting was everybody trying to slay the beast. So you all, you had these. And I don't want to say pretenders, but you had all of these players be good players and have good tournaments. And then they would have the match of their lives against Serena. <laughs> you know, Kerber, match of her life against Serena. Muguruza, match of her life against Serena. S Sam Stozer, match of her life against Serena. So Serena was the standard, and everybody was trying to live up to that. And it's going to, like, once again, and, and they were so ubiquitous. And Serena was so ubiquitous that there were so many times where American media and the USTA, they would just sort of forget them. Like they treat them like they're not even American. We're like, oh, we, when's the next American champion going to come? Well, you've had one for the last damn near 30 years. Howard, what does she mean culturally? Well, and then there's that. Then there's the other piece of it, which is, of course, the the cultural piece, you know, during the Me Too era, during the era of equal pay, uh, what Serena has meant, obviously, to black women in the sport, women of color in the sport, and fans in, in particular, who felt, you know, you want to talk about a, you know, a beehive. Okay, Beyonce's got her group, but my goodness, criticize Serena on Twitter and, and Lord pray for what happens to you next. I mean, there really is a, she's a symbol of a lot of people who didn't feel hurt, a lot of people who felt like they were being marginalized and for, you know, Serena's victories were their victories. And in so many, so many cases, especially at the U.S. Open against Osaka, when they felt like she was being completely wrong. Um, yeah, there was a lot of theater there that was based on a lot of emotions that didn't have a lot to do with tennis. How poorly were they treated coming up? Oh, they're treated terribly. I mean, you don't want them there. I remember 2012 Wimbledon. Um, it's my first Wimbledon. I walk out and there's Richard Williams sitting there 
used to smoke these little cigarettes like Moore's. Remember Moore's cigarettes? He used to smoke these really tiny little cigarettes. And, um, and he, <laughs> you know, when <laughs> that is when, not when, probably <laughs> what they were used to at Wimbledon. <laughs> exactly. Back in it, Richard Williams sitting over there smoking. And when Richard ever saw somebody black, right? He had to bring you over. Like you had to come sit at grandpa's knee and he was going to tell you what it was. And he hadn't seen me before because I'd never been to Wimbledon before. He pulls me over and we sit and we talk for like 45 minutes. And one of the first things he says is you got to remember, they don't want us here. They've never wanted us here. And I told Venus, I told my girls, there's only one way for them to respect you. And that's win. If you win, they have to listen to you and they can't get rid of you. And when you walk around the grounds at Wimbledon, you go through the stairwells, you go through the hallways, there's nothing but pictures of Venus and Serena because they won so many. She's got five, you know, Serena's got, what, eight of them? And so when you're when you're looking at this from a motivational standpoint, from a historical standpoint, and just a, an emotional standpoint, they knew they were in hostile territory from day one, and they knew that the only way that they were going to navigate this hostile territory was to beat everybody's ass, and that's pretty much what they did. Howard, I'm not sure how much of the Vogue article you've actually had the chance to read, but I, I did find interesting that she really doesn't seem like she wants to retire. She thinks that no, she, she could be Tom Brady, uh, which she actually does mention Tom Brady in the piece. She says, maybe I'd be more of a Tom Brady if I had that opportunity, that opportunity not being that she had she started a family and that she had a child and that it affected her performance and her daughter wants a sister and wants to carry on, she could potentially be an even greater figure. And later on in the piece, she also talks about she's really struggled with it. She doesn't even want to use the word retire. Do you no, think she, that she's actually fully retiring from the game? No, that was the other thing about the story. Like when you read the headlines, it says, Serena Williams suggests retirement. She's not completely gone yet, right? There's a, she's one of them. She don't know how to let it go. This is what she knows. And, and like people are like, oh, when is, I understand the reflex of not wanting to watch your heroes get crushed, to not watch her get demolished, because that's eventually what's going to happen, because that's what happens to all of them. You can't play forever. But she doesn't, she's not ready to say goodbye. She doesn't want to quit. They don't know how to quit. This is what they've done. And you've done something like this since you were 12 years old or six years old since you were playing. I mean, why would you let it go that easily, especially when you're her, you know? I've always asked the question, how long do you play? Like what, you know, especially in, indiv in, in an individual sport, are you comfortable? Now, Venus can do it, but are you comfortable going out there and getting knocked out in the second and third round? Serena's not doing that. Serena's not doing that. I mean, there's, there's only three ways to retire. You know, the game retires you because you can't play anymore. Your body retires you because your body won't let you do it anymore. Or you go out on top. And very few people walk in the in, in door number three. I actually appreciate that she doesn't want to go out like like Venus is. It's a little different because Venus wasn't as dominant because of Serena. But to see what happens to Venus last night, I can't really imagine that happening to Serena. It's also kind of interesting for being such great rivals in their history. They face each other like 31 times, and they've had maybe three good matches. All terrible. They're they're all terrible. They they don't really seem to enjoy playing each other and we don't have those memorable matches between Why the two of them. they enjoy playing each other? I mean, it, does, it, just, it, it seems got, like one always checks out when the other person has very clearly got the good form going. It, there's always conspiracy theories about why those matches aren't really that good. How insulting is that to say that one of them was tanking matches, one of the greatest competitors of all time? Do you really think she's... <laughs> just giving wait, wait, wait. voice to long-standing... There should not be... It is a little curious, Howard, that they only have had... It doesn't a, seem like you're lending small, your voice. <laughs> I'm lending my voice to the conspiracy theories. It's flatly weird that the two... Arguably the two greatest tennis players of the modern era never really had good matches despite right, playing name, each other plenty of uh, times. Name, name me a, a comparable experience where you're going up against a family member. And not only you're going up against a family member, but you guys are going to be partners in the doubles after the match. <laughs> but Howard, she's already gone through some of this. Like she lost first round of Wimbledon. She lost early, Wimbledon. I think. I'm sorry about that. She lost early in a French Open recently. Like she's gone through some of what, what Venus is going through right now. Like she's yeah, done look, that. When you, get, when, you, when you get whooped by Harmony Tan, it's time to go. 
<laughs> Howard, I want to. Fair sw- point. I want to switch gears. Put that gears. on the poll. I mean, I want to switch gears. I know you, uh, you're obviously a big comic book guy. You're you're geared more towards Marvel, but there are some interesting things happening in the DC universe, and uh, you and I are pretty aligned on how we feel about the the mess that the DC universe has become. But it's even getting more messy now with Discovery entering the fray. They have already canceled one film in Batgirl saving the company 90 million dollars by just not releasing it because if they release it on HBO Max that even though Warner Brothers owns it they have to pay licensing fees so they shelve it so there's already one movie that Michael Keaton is playing Batman in that won't see the light of day and all throughout these last few months even prior to the merger was the Flash movie that has been postponed and postponed while the star, Ezra Miller, has gone through it publicly. There are allegations that he is running, that they are running a cult, that they have recently been arrested on felony burglary charges, all sorts of terrible stories surrounding them. So what do you make of Ezra Miller, and will we ever see Michael Keaton as Batman again? (laughs) He was better in Birdman than Batman. I'll take Birdman. Um, I, I have been trying like most people to make sense of this. And whenever I think of the DC universe, the only thing I can think of is I just want to see all the checks. I mean, has there ever been another franchise launch that has just blown so much? I mean, the money (laughs) is staggering here. I mean, and, and, you know, and no disrespect to the actors, obviously the stories just haven't been very, very good. They're not good at all. I mean, I will say, um, I think the Dark Knight Rises, I thought, was a spectacular movie. Um, everything else has just not been really good. I mean, I mean, if you're canceling movies, how does Wonder Woman 84 still exist in the universe? I mean, <laughs> I, and, thank oh, you for God. saying that. <laughs> and, and I want to just give a big shout out to Dan, who seems to make no distinction between DC and Marvel in these intros. I just love, I love, <laughs> but, no, I love that about you personally uh, uh that note see you later howard good talking to you uh appreciate your passion about all of these things and your expertise appreciate it sir bill lawrence going to join us in studio next yeah, our friend bill lawrence is in studio he's in uh miami here for a couple of months he's wearing it he's wearing <laughs> he's wearing he a sure little is, bit yes. of miami <laughs> about a month too long in miami you've yeah, spent it gets on you Yes. Uh, what have what has your experience been? Uh, just tasting the, this this city, this weird city. Well, in a in a in a normal city, like one day in Vegas is a hundred days in other other cities. But it's maybe Miami to Vegas is like two to one only. So it's it's rough, man. <laughs> so you've been two, so you've done two months of Vegas. Yeah, yeah. yeah you never. And it comes from all sides. You know, you could be it could be midday. You'd be talking to someone that looks like a, a you know a housewife or a mom, and she's like, two o'clock. Maybe we should go get about nine drinks. It's a it's got that vibe. Do you have Do you have a lot of armed people in and around uh, wherever it is that you're where staying? I, where I live, I live in a uh, over in South Beach in a um, condominium that you can tell. I think you can tell in the Russian oligarchs are there because suddenly there's armed security guards yeah <laughs> you could tell when when they flood in uh to the and and what have you noticed what what about what about your living arrangement uh what have you ever tried this much miami before no i have not man the you know and, and all my roots and, and my florida roots are in central florida you know uh, some over in orlando and winter park my parents went to college at rollins and then the rest of my family lives over in deland where stetson is you know so Miami has only been a cup of coffee for me, and uh, getting a firsthand view of it is uh, is like nowhere. I think you got to see it once. I don't know if you have to see it twice. <laughs> You're ready <laughs> to leave, aren't you? Right? <laughs> You're ready to get the hell out of here, aren't you? Right? Yeah. Ready for a month? Yes. It's the same as you. You uh, you come. To, you were afraid of South Beach because you were going to leave addicted to cigarettes and shit. If and I'm addicted. Yeah. 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 Exactly. You got you. Yeah. yeah. Bad yeah. things happen here. Exactly. I'm you. you yeah. I should tell people. Uh, you could have chosen any project in the world after making Ted Lasso, and you came to Florida and did the Carl Hyacin novel, and are almost done. I would assume. Yeah, we're almost for the last last couple of weeks right now. How how do you feel about the project? Oh, and- it's cool. You know, it's awesome experience. I love Carl. I loved actually shooting Florida for Florida. Um, I wouldn't necessarily try it again. But the uh, 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 what a cool experience. Just there's no other state that looks like this. You can't fake it anywhere. Combination of Everglades is a half an hour away. South Beach is here going out to the Keys. It's been pretty insane, you know, as far as 
environmentally and the way it looks and stuff. But, Have you ever had a budget like this to play with after that success, Apple Television? We were just talking before you came in here about how discerning Apple is with its choices and how they've set themselves up uh, to be a different kind of streaming model that's going to do it differently than Netflix is doing. It. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because everything in entertainment, is, it, it, it lines up with what you guys are doing. It's a reaction, and, and Netflix... Uh, I'll end my career on Netflix yet again. That's all I do in this show is prevent myself from ever working on Netflix. Uh, they they stopped kind of curating their brand a little bit. So it just seems there's, a lot of, there's good stuff on there, but it seems like, hey, are you interested in everything? And, uh, uh, you know, Apple is really kind of curates it like, hey, this is our brand. These are the type of shows we do. And uh, if you like one of them, you'll probably like most of them. Uh, I think that kind of lines up with the stuff that you guys are doing too. You know, it's very easy to do, throw 9,000 things at a wall. But when I, when I see the ancillary stuff you guys are doing, it all seems on brand. And I, I think Apple's doing that too. Have you enjoyed it? Cause I would feel a, a great burden of pressure. You're a creator who's created for a long time confidently and you're a bit of a product prodigy, but I would feel having to make the next thing after Ted Lasso, that, that would feel like pressure to me. Uh, no, but only because I've been around long enough for the inevitable ups and downs, you know what I mean, which is TV by nature is cyclical. Uh, I was um, uh, hot and then cold and then hot and then cold, and I'm hot now. I'll be cold again very soon. Eventually someone will say, hey, is Ted Lasso just scrubs with different characters? And uh, uh, is he doing the same? <laughs> <laughs> but you have expectations now. Like People are expecting stuff from you, Oh, but right? he's got the right attitude. If, yeah. you're just, if you're making the shit you're making without pressure, God bless. You've arrived at a blissful, blissful place. Like, you still work for a corporation, right? Or you still have their people to answer to. But God almighty, this has to be the most creative uh, freedom you've ever, liberation you've ever felt. Yeah, without a doubt. Hey, look, it's one of the reasons I dig on this show is uh, uh, it feels like people doing what they want to do. And I'm, I, I have the luxury right now of, of getting to do what I want to do. And, and, you know, it'll it'll either work or, or it won't. But I've always just said, we used to joke around that I wanted to call it Noble Failure Productions because uh, if you can show this stuff to your friends and family without being mortified, you know, you can't really ask for anything. You can't control anything else, you know, uh, where people are going to care or not. But I, I think the show's good. I think... Um, you know, and I've been a fan of Carl's for so long, and I know he's a fan of, of this show, too, that that uh, uh, just getting a chance to do that was really cool for me. It's like, oh, you read these books growing up, and now you get to turn one into a TV show. That was pretty badass. I want to treat TV the way we treat sports, where yeah. you've had a hit show, but do it again, Lawrence. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you got you to do it again. Do it again. Show yeah. up. <laughs> do, do, you, do you have any idea? Because I'm, I'd be interested in talking about the business with you. I find that you guys have such unique viewpoints as creators trying to make their way through the corporate labyrinth. Do you have any idea what you've done for Apple with Ted Lasso? Because that was the first one that got everyone's attention. Is uh, it not? I do. And by the way, you're always nice to say me. But always, I always have to take the time to go. Sudeikis crushed it, and uh, uh, you know the other the other creators, Joe Kelly, Brendan Hunt. Um, but yeah, we we all read uh, uh, an article that said, and uh, someone can research here, but they put an article out that said that Ted Lasso is the number one show as far as causing new subscribers to get onto any of these sites. So it's kind of ended up being almost single-handedly responsible initially for uh, uh, the subscribers, a base of Apple, you know, just growing in a giant way. What was your expectation at the start of that? It couldn't Nothing. have been that. No. I was just hoping, you know, like I do with every show, man, I just hope it doesn't make me look like an idiot. You know, and, uh, you know, beyond that. It's a very low bar. Yeah, but <laughs> you'd be surprised, man. But yeah, I always I always say that uh, one of the best things about my career is that the really, really, really awful shows I made, except for one, uh, don't get on TV. Because you still often, you make, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, basements of these studios are littered with five, 10, 15 million dollar pilots that are so bad they can't put them on. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if this is the case, but you might've read that Warner Brothers made a, a huge feature out of Batgirl and just announced last week that they're not even, they're not gonna show it to anybody. Well, this is what I wanted to ask you about where the industry is headed, what you see, because I thought Mike Schur had an illuminated uh, perspective on it, and I yeah. imagine you would too from your vantage point. Well, no matter what his perspective is, mine's gonna be different because, you know, enough with Mike Schur. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. You know what? I don't need to it's mention it. Yeah, maybe it wasn't that show. illuminated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it, was, it wasn't that illuminated. No, it was a no, I think sure, you can do better. I think I'm sure Mike's insight was amazing. 
You're, you can do better. You can, you're, you uh, can tell us what's happening in this. <laughs> you know, if, I, if you ask me a tough question, I'll call Mike up and ask what the answer is, just so, just so I know. I want to <laughs> I want to keep this going so bad, man. Please do. <laughs> it, uh, well, they hate each other. There I said it. Okay, I want the audience to know. Uh, this guy, Lawrence, has been a nemesis of Mike Schur for many, many years. Everyone needs to know it uh, oh. because he's been the uh, you've been the wonder kid. Uh, but regardless, you you don't worry, right? You don't. There's you've arrived at a place in your career that HBO Max shutting it down doesn't affect you, but it affects the industry, it affects people you care about, and it affects content because you can't take seventy percent of HBO Max and not gut the place. Right. Look, the uh, uh, there's the one of the realities uh, of entertainment is if you create content, you're always going to find a way. Okay. Uh, What's tough, really, all you're really talking about is what the compensation system ends up being. Because you guys know, they, 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 even if they, they keep uh, uh, you know, merging and all of entertainment becomes three or four companies, they're still all going to need content. The only thing people are going to get hammered on, uh, I would imagine, is uh, how little they get paid for doing stuff that they used to get paid you know, a lot for. But content is king. Um, so it doesn't bump me too much, this kind of, uh, uh, ongoing treadmill of all, all these guys kind of sucking up the other companies and, and controlling what they put out there. I also think that no matter what they do, if you find something that breaks through leverage shifts and it's going to continue to be that way, whether it's a, a podcast, a book, a movie, um, TV shows, you know, the second that people are seeking that out, there's a leverage shift and you just got to know how to use it. Mr. God's Bill has come in with uh, one of his sons, and I would describe this young man as foul to his core as a sports fan because <laughs> it's about transactions and numbers. My kind and of the, kid. The, the players I mean. are just <laughs> commodities and assets, and uh, they're just fantasy things to be traded and swapped, and I find him just generally offensive, even though I just <laughs> met him. Well, look, I'll give him props. Will, the kid, the, the guy that's here is a, is a baller. He probably he and Tony had to guard each other a bunch, so I'll let Tony say how that went because uh will's a, will's a sniper yeah he's good it's really? he had a game where he had like five or six threes yeah, from deep too but you're okay. better right i mean, I mean no, i'm not gonna say that i will say uh, this obviously. i'll say this to embarrass my son he hit he was shooting lights out and uh uh the nice guy that runs that game chris uh, yeah chris said uh will you got to keep that guy from driving and this is in a pickup game and will said they don't pay me to play defense in a <laughs> this guy gets it. <laughs> uh, but he looks at sports all wrong. And you've been arguing about Kevin Durant yeah. all day. Well, look, this this guy, uh, my youngest son looks at sports wrong. Because my youngest son, who Dan, you guys have seen on uh, uh, Zoom, he, he follows, it's fantasy. So it's whoever's on his fantasy. There's no real teams. Uh, this guy is the opposite side of the coin a little bit. Although, and you've talked about it here, he does one thing I don't like. He does us a lot, like we, you know, the Clipper. We we have a great chance to do it this year. He's, whatever team he likes, he's on the team. What's that, wrong with that? It drives me crazy, uh -huh. man. He's, he's not on the team. He, you didn't raise him right. You didn't, that's, that's a failure. That's a reflection on you every time that he does it. But what have you been arguing about Durant? Oh, we've been arguing about Durant because I uh, I was I really liked it. It came out, I'm sure you guys saw it, came out that uh, Durant said, you know, it's either me or Nash and the GM. GM is Marks, yeah? Yeah, yeah Marks. Sean yeah, Marks. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I'm a, and the, the owner supported his management. And I'm like, oh, good. And and. My son actively thinks it's a monster mistake, and it's all about the players, and it should be whatever Durant wants. He's right. All right. But it has been everything Durant wants. And yeah, now, how's that going? Yeah, it's not going very well. And that was leaked yesterday. Like, nobody knows the contents of that meeting. So when I read Sham saying it's either me or them, like Durant's putting that out there, they're not going to put that out there. No, he wants it out there. Yeah. He, he wants it out there. It's a good move to force exactly what happened, which is Joe Sy coming out, having to publicly back his head coach and GM, and now he can continue to force his way because he obviously wasn't happy with the time this was taking. It was an alpha move from Durant. He was also curious ESPN's lack of reporting on it because it wasn't broken by their reporter. All of it was really interesting. And the fact that there isn't a massive Nets fan base is the only reason why we're just now talking about it because what Kevin Durant is doing is nuking that franchise. Yeah. It is all him. 
He he is in the bed that he well, it made. Well, started right? with Kyrie, Mike. He's in the bed that he made. He signed a year ago today. He, he signed four years, two hundred million dollars a year ago today. Doesn't like the direction of the franchise. Kind of, he was in on this. You made the franchise. He is the direction of the franchise. <laughs> no, but I think what happened is he thought playing with Kyrie was a good idea and then realized along the way, hey, not such a good idea. He doesn't want these things the way I want these things. Has he? He he I, I think I think he still Kevin wants Durant's it. been there and been healthy for the playoffs. Kyrie's missed them. It's everybody else's fault, but he doesn't understand that. It all went the direction that he wanted. Kyrie's got a Kyrie. That's part of the evaluation. <laughs> but you're the Nets, and you have Kevin Durant. Like you're, I, wait, wait, you're saying, but you're the you Nets. You get rid of the coach. You get rid of the GM. You've yeah. never had a player like Kevin yeah. Durant. You're saying, but you're the Nets. Don't you think with the shift to Brooklyn and the money they had, they were set up to succeed like no other franchise in a long time. 100%. And they just, they just yeah. pooped the bed, man. Yeah. Yeah. You're a Sixers a, fan, so I guess you like to see it, right? Yeah, I love to see it. I am, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been hassled before. I'm a lifelong Sixers fan. You're I more can, of a tampering guy. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. I don't believe that. That never happened. But if Durant wanted to go to the Sixers <laughs> and said, get rid of Doc Rivers, would you be okay getting rid of Doc Rivers? Yeah, he's... Uh, <laughs> do, I think Doc, do I think You're Doc Rivers is good at X's and O's coach? Or do I think Doc is a good player coach? I don't know. What if Durant says get rid of Maury? I mean, um, well, let's do it this way, Mike. You hate the, you hate the Sixers. He represents their fan base. Yes. You think the Sixers are raging frauds? Yeah. They don't they don't have the history that the Miami Heat. They do. don't have. They barely have any. He's got to go back to Mo Cheeks well, and Daryl Dawkins. I'm old enough that I can go Mo Cheeks, Andrew uh, uh, Andrew Tony, Bobby Bobby Jones, yeah. Caldwell Jones, Daryl Dawkins. And it's amazing that you chocolate can, thunder. I'm happy that you can remember a, a Philadelphia 76ers championship. It was that long. Yeah. It, it did not happen. I don't know if LeBron lifetime. was playing back then, but we didn't buy him for championships. We, <laughs> just, we just did it. You bought Moses Malone. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I'm blocking that. Out. Wait, was, was he the one that said four, four, yes, and four? Yes, that is the one. <laughs> Moses. Uh, that's the last time Philadelphia won is 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was born in 1985. Yeah. Never in my life have they. They've made it to one final. Iverson single handedly took him to the final against the Lakers. They won the first game. He stepped over uh, uh, what's his face, Ty the head Lou. coach. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, that's kind of like a title, right? That counts. was your title moment. Isn't I, by it? the way, I was at that game, and uh, I could have, I could not have told people more that the Sixers were going to win in six or seven. You were <laughs> walking out of game one. <laughs> <laughs> I felt so good, right? He's irrationally strutting out of game one. Oh, yeah. no, and and every, oh my god! Every basketball season, I dread it. Is this the year they're finally going to make it past the second round? And thankfully, the Sixers always Sixer. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> yeah, one one of the easier you gotta, you gotta right. what, What's the other option? Come you, hell or high water <laughs> or uh, private sponsorship deals oh, with gambling entities that oh. owners have divested themselves from the NBA for. It's all so bad. <laughs> <laughs> what I love so much is they were the ones that lodged a complaint on the Kyle Lowry stuff no, last I know, year. I know. And now they've done this. Bill, Look, Bill that, does, was, that was your comeback. Your comeback is one of these two teams has actually paid a penalty for tampering. I know. Multiple look, look, times. Look, oh, yours look. is coming. I, my, art, art's coming, A. And B, yeah. look. Get, the, get the, that second round pick ready. If you're a true Philadelphia fan, because um, I lived outside of Philly when I was a kid, just and my dad took I, I, my, I'm a fan of the whatever team I saw first live. And it was the Phillies, uh, Sixers, uh, Flyers, and then but the first football team I saw was the Dolphins. But the Phillies, at least for a long Sorry. time, yeah. were doing it right. And I don't know if you – because one of the things my sons grew up with was the Phillies were one of those teams that actually kept their core of uh, 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 Rollins and Utley and Ruiz and uh, the Flying Hawaiian – and uh, kept that core together and actually won a couple of times. I mean, they had to go get Halliday, but, you know, they did it right. And uh, I wouldn't necessarily go to the mat saying the Sixers are doing it right. So. James Harden, though, you like better in the player empowerment stuff. Durant's nuking one franchise while Harden is doing wink-wink uh, discount deals so that they can tamper with P.J. Tucker. Oh, it's so hard to love Harden, man. Isn't it? <laughs> That one's got to be a mind bleep for people. Did you see? Did you see Harden and Kevin Durant in London celebrating oh. with Travis Scott? Like they're best buds again. This is is such a weird thing. Like Kevin Durant does not want to pay any of the ramifications oh. for his own decisions. Well, he, he doesn't, doesn't want to, any, though. But he doesn't want to is, suffer consequences. No, but he doesn't have to. To me, it's not that he doesn't want to suffer consequences. May we all arrive in a place at work where we're so valuable that there are no consequences. Like now, his, because he doesn't care about the tatters, he doesn't have to care about the image anymore. It's not about I'm going to sell sneakers like LeBron. I'm, I'm going to be second place throughout all of this, and I've sort of destroyed whatever it is that doing the right way is. And so now, 
everyone still wants him, and he's going to, he has still oh, all the power him. after nuking them. He's nuked them. I, I could never. It is a level of shamelessness, and I, I'm actually jealous of how little Kevin Durant cares because looking at this wreckage in your rearview mirror of what you've done to this Nets franchise, if I were in Durant's shoes, I, I would just keep my head down. I'd push through. I'd try to find a way. I'll make it work with Simmons. Like, I made my bed. I'm, I picked this GM. I picked this coach. Care, I picked Mike. these teammates. Yeah. I could never make a public mess of it. No consequences for Kevin Durant. In fact, his Q rating's probably gone up throughout all this. What? There are consequences. He just doesn't care about those consequences. Like, he's never going to be looked back at as one of the all-time greats. He won't. That's right? not true. That's no, not true. No. no. That's that not is, true. Dan, that's the truth. No one's going to sit here 15 years from now talking about top five NBA players of all time well, and include Kevin Durant I mean, in that conversation. I mean, okay, so Mike, Sorry, it's not happening. I mean, uh, you don't think they'll talk about him like they do Marino as a guy that was no. one of the best scorers of all time as opposed to one of the best pure passers of all time. I, I, I do think if you played out his career a hundred times, this might be the worst version of it. <laughs> Seriously, because he is, he is that yes. good and... That's Never won a title in Oklahoma thing. City. Yes. Jumped on a bandwagon in Golden State and has destroyed this. Like this is about as poorly as it could have gone, given how absolutely incredible at basketball. He I is. don't think anybody would call his uh, career a disappointment, though. You? Oh, would? I think it is. Oh, absolutely. I think it definitely because is a he's so talented, Dan. You guys believe that a guy who's never existed before at that height, who is going to be remembered, no matter what you say now, as one of the best scorers anybody has ever seen, you believe that people going forward don't think he's every bit as great as he is? Like that if if he won, how many championships do you have to have him winning before I don't. you well, accept he's that he's... negative two right now, so he's got about eight to go before he catches I Jordan. Don't. I, mean... I don't. And the narrative on his time in Golden State you think his flipped. career is a disappointment, Kevin Durant, yes, because he's bit. so talented. That's I do. why he, he won I mean, two titles, and I mean. with one Steph Curry Finals MVP run recently, I think the narrative on his time in Golden State has flipped a little bit. In my opinion, Kevin Durant is the second best player to come into the league since the time of Jordan. I think he's better than Shaq. I think he's better than Kobe. I think he's better than all of those guys. He just so happens to play in LeBron James's era, and he's made poor decision after poor decision that has hurt his own legacy. And the Brooklyn thing is chief among them. I don't know how you are one of the best historic ever and a disappointment. You've placed the expectations for me in a because place you've made lousy decisions. I've got a, I got a good a good bet. My bet would be, because the thing that's been freaking me out about sports is how quickly the narrative shifts, and I bet you Durant has a turnaround on his story within a calendar year. But to Mike's point, he's saying stay with the Nets. That's the best possible chance Depend I, 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 yeah, Depending I, on his, which team he goes to, I might agree with you. Yes, I'm speaking in generalities. Right. I, I've noticed when people <laughs> bottom out in this level of sports. And perhaps you'll be right. I, yes. I made an argument for third greatest player of all time just now. Yeah, no. When most <laughs> people are taking curry over him. It's aggressive. It's oh, like, yeah. yeah. Culture. <laughs> I love these stupid arguments where Mike James gets dragged, okay, because he says Steph Curry not in top five for me, too much one-dimensional. And – not top five right now. He's not saying ever. He's saying there are five players better than him. And I know that everyone dragged Mike James as who the bleep is Mike James. Uh, but I thought to myself, yeah, I mean, he did change the entire sport. But those other five guys, they're really great, too. And if the line here on whether you're historically great or not is Stugatz's top five, will I play? Will I place you <laughs> in my top five? 15 years from uh, now. Uh, okay. that's, a, that's a huge yeah. metric. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It's, it's a hard one. You will be able to forever say Kevin Durant's not in my top five, but I don't think I'll be able to say it. No, you'll be able to say it, Dan. It'll be you and I on rocking chairs out on a patio doing you know we're not doing a show live but we're still doing a show because we're always doing show we'll talk top five nba players you'll realize then kevin durant is not one of them all right let's close okay. out the segment here with top five lemonade. ways to measure things <laughs> top five number five well, mike Eddie. ryan the top this is the top five ways to rank things number five is goat status excellent is something the goat or not? That is number five. Number four on this list, the totem pole. Mm -hmm. The bottom is the is the best, right? We don't yeah, know. Yeah, we we which actually did. Well, the bottom is the top. 
the, the I think the bottom is the top. It became it was co opted, and now that top of the totem pole is the most important. But if you actually do the research, bottom of the totem pole is the most crucial to the actual totem pole. Did you know that, Bill Lawrence? Did you want to Did you want to be on top of the totem pole or at the bottom of the? I want to be on the top of the totem pole. You want to be on the bottom. You want to be on the bottom. Mm. That's not true, but go ahead. Number Everybody three. be in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> this guy gets it. Yeah. Number three, metal stand. Ooh. Excellent. Bronze, silver, and gold. Mm-hmm. Number two, Mount Rushmore. Excellent. And number one, top five list. <laughs> oh, not ranked. I, I don't know if Stugatz is mad or what the groans are about, he but is. he's uh, he's muttering about Adam Shine. Yeah. He's, uh, again, Shine on sports. I mean. I, why are you muttering? What is happening with Adam Shine? What, has he disgusted uh, you? I, I'm not mad at Adam Shine. I am mad at you and Mike because I had a great relationship with Aaron Rodgers. This show had a great relationship with Aaron Rodgers. And now, I said earlier that he used to do two shows. It was our show, and uh, he used to do uh, Pat McAfee. He still does Pat McAfee. But now he has left our show. He did part of my take yesterday. And so I felt like he was replacing us with part of my take. Well, but they, now, went to, they went to go see him. They went to Green Bay to whatever. go Whatever. He did the show, and now I feel like he's rubbing it in. Dan, you know I track these things. He has never done Adam Shine's show in his life. And today, boom, Aaron Rodgers, Shine on Sports. I mean, we are doomed. So I'm mad at the two of you because you refuse to say anything nice about the guy. He's the greatest quarterback who's ever lived. I mean, someone say something nice. I have said something nice. I said so he was I. better than Saudi Arabia. He's oh. going <laughs> to I was about to say, my, I, on the way here, my son said, talk, because Aaron Rodgers is his favorite player. He said, talk about ayahuasca. I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> well, Tony thought the you smoked receiver. ayahuasca. Yeah. You do not smoke. Tony wants, uh, Tony is railing okay. against the drug system. He doesn't understand how it is that Aaron Rodgers is allowed to smoke some plant, but I don't think that's how it works with ayahuasca. Dan, Josh Gordon must be furious right now. He must be looking around saying, okay, so this guy can go do whatever that is and I can't, you know, do a little thing here and there. Well, that that is a little strange. The differences between marijuana and ayahuasca, but you don't have any experience with this because I, I, uh, I'm going to admit something I've not admitted before. Uh, in the name of uh, brain exploration and stretching the mind, I've done <laughs> clinically tested ketamine re- recently. Look at that oh, research table. for research reasons. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, a little wow. special K for Ooh, breakfast. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, worth some. Uh, that wow. explains a lot. It's very yeah. It's a lot. Yes, it's a horse tranquilizer, <laughs> and it was Jesus. It, yeah, it was a, it was a it was a uh, out of body experience that brought me close to the brink of death blissfully. But that is what people are searching for with ayahuasca. How do they, how do they administer that? Then, uh, you you just run around and they hit you with a dart, or you just no, use it's, a, you take? it's an IV, yeah. and uh, you're there with a scientist in a very quiet room. How official is this scientist? Yeah, well, it's Miami question. official. Yeah, he's a guy. <laughs> <laughs> out of your minds? He trusted it? I mean, was a scientist wearing a white coat? <laughs> I did six. I did six treatments. Was a scientist wearing a white coat? It's a great point, because if you're a real scientist, you have to wear a white coat. You yeah. have to. Yeah. Professor Gilligan's Island. I mean, everyone knows. 24-7. I mean, it depends on when you ask me, because the scientist at one point was just floating above my head in circles. I'm, in, I, I'm on Team Dan. I'm doing a show. Uh, there's a show back in uh, L.A. about therapists and one of the things we were researching mdma is now one of the main uh research techniques in therapy for trauma addiction and any of that stuff and they're starting to use it johns hopkins cedar sinai and so it literally is you know essentially ecstasy therapy you know i would i'm in i would like to talk to aaron Rodgers about what he's doing like what he's searching for what what has caused him to head down this path where he believes that his brain chemistry needs to be altered? Well, he's actually talking about that with other shows. Yeah, I was about to say. Shine on sports. <laughs> he's calling he's 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 into Where he actually revealed that nugget was him talking about it in great detail with someone not Dan Levitard. <laughs> Stugatz has sent the email. I have no response. I am telling you, Tom <laughs> Fanning has never gone 11 minutes without responding to me. It is now, I think, yeah, two hours. Sad. 
since I sent that email. Sad and pathetic. Yep. Find a new Aaron Rodgers. We will, right. we will, Let's be Josh Allen, guys. We, if, no, no, if, the, he's also part of my take. we got to find a new guy. Yeah. How about I believe Bronco he, Nation? Let's ride. Let's ride. We will uh, <laughs> in, increase our potential to have major quarterbacks want to be on the show if we win a Grammy for Best Musical. The nominations come out this week? No, we uh, this month, at the end of this month, closes the entry process. And this week, we are formally submitting the Big Game Musical as a... i got to really slow down how I say that. Uh, otherwise, I run into the Izzy Gutierrez joke at the, at the end. The Big Game Musical. Uh, we're formally submitting it for Best Musical Theater Album. And we hope, with this platform, we can uh, avoid um, some very hefty uh, promotional fees... They come with actual formal Grammy uh, campaigns. <laughs> I did not know what a booming business this was, but every time you see a billboard for Ted Lasso for your consideration, best comedy series, that costs at least I'm um, like several thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. there is a like eight budget. or nine hundred bucks. Yeah, you guys set aside a budget. <laughs> it's not us. These companies spend bazillions of dollars uh, marketing, promoting, publicity awards. Yes. So we're trying to do that, but by spending a about 7K in Ethereum. Sure. That's all we have. Is it a meritocracy in the award system, or can you buy these awards? Oh, no. Oh, what? Well, it depends on which one you're talking. Any ones I've won, total meritocracy. Right. <laughs> but the ones that other ones have won. Yeah, those could be bought. They could be bought. Right? Be bought. <laughs> so, but I have, I have familiarized myself with all the rules, and I know that if I bump into a... An Academy member, I I ask them, are you a recording Academy member? Yeah. And I just tell them, I'm here to raise awareness. I'm not there to formally ask anybody sure. for their votes. But if you are around any of your other recording Academy friends, can you continue to raise awareness? I've even started a grassroots cameo campaign with some football voices. Oh, and I got rejected on my first request. And this was actually a really funny story because it's the first time I've submitted for a cameo and got a phone call from the camp of the person that was denying my request. I requested Dave Wanstat to do a 90 second promo. <laughs> on he why, said no? On why the big game should be considered by the Recording Academy for best musical theater God, album. Maybe that would have been funny. And I had, because of like the weird Mario Cristobal plugged in coaches search contacts that I've made, I got a phone call from someone that was actually with a very confused Dave Wanstead, who I heard in the background in his very distinguishable accent, asking what the heck. I'd, he didn't want to embarrass him, himself, and he thought that we were making a joke of him. And I tried to explain in excruciating detail what I was going for. He still passed at the opportunity. <laughs> I was then offered a former USC head football coach that wasn't Pete Carroll, and I wasn't interested. Uh, At Orgeron? No, I would uh, totally take Ed Orcheron. <laughs> oh, that would be huge. Oh, yeah. I think I can. That's probably a good move for Ed as, as, yeah. as his first big move I back there. I think I can get an Ed Orcheron. Ed, Ed's been spending a lot of time around the UN football program, yes, I saw. Sir. A lot, yes, of, sir. lot of practice. I think his son is involved. Isn't Lane Kiffin coming on the show this week? Can we get him to do it? I've I've cons his cameo price is very hefty. Well, can we just get him steep. to do it on the yeah. show though, like and send it out as an advertisement, like just uh, have him do a commercial or whatever it is that you need a video to uh, submit to the academy and see if they're impressed by Lane Kiffin. I do need to go back for a second though and point out to you that while he might have been bewildered by the phone call and the request, Dave Wanstead must have known somewhere in there and rejecting you, oh, I'm being made the joke here. I am that you can well, say the, however it is that you want that this Levitard is a, you show, want my sincere endorsement. The Levitard the, show the, did raise some red flags considering we once actually made a brick and mortar restaurant that was called Wani McStashes. <laughs> <laughs> we did do that. We, we did okay. do that. We did it. Uh, can Lane you get Kiffin, me the menu? Can you just find me the menu to Wani McStashes so that you great. would understand why? I know that we why. had puntetizers. Lane Kiffin is three hundred dollars on Cameo. Hefty Jesus. fee. Jesus. Hefty fee. And I'd rather have that have that go towards a billboard in like Des Moines, Iowa, because I can't actually afford the Hollywood strip. Mm. Whittingham, you know that Bill Lawrence, I did not know this about Bill Lawrence until recently, uh, because you you were getting some criticism here as being a nationally negative local voice on Tua Tonga Vailoa. And uh, somebody writes in, Fancy Lad is the reason I support Tua. He receives such a flood of unfair criticism from him that I can't help but root for him. Whittingham pretends to know what Tua is when there's no way anyone can honestly judge whether or not he's any good. And Chris will not be allowed on the Tua train 
once it's out of the station. Excellent. Oh my god! Yes. What? It's still there. Kicked off the Tua train. He is banned. <laughs> uh, banned from the Tua train. I like that. Bill Lawrence. I believe. Listen to this. <laughs> why, nice. why do you believe? You you be careful here. I gotta be careful. All right. Why do you believe? Lifelong Dolphins fan, as you know. Uh the uh my grandmother took me to see Miami Dolphins. Uh, I saw the Dolphins when Greasy was the quarterback. I was a little kid. And uh but if I'm answering why he is not there's no possible way yet that you could say, aside from just saying my opinion is better than yours, that he is uh, going to fail. He hasn't been given the opportunity to succeed yet. And if you're an actual fan, until he's given, you know, this year is going to be a make or break year. He's either going to show us he can be an NFL quarterback or it'll be an afterthought. And if I'm a true fan, how can I go with, uh, I already know it's not going to work. I don't want to live in the negativity. This is a Ted Lasso world. Live in the positive. But you requested... You specifically requested, my opinion is better than yours, and I present to you one fancy lad. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, he is done. He does not want his expectations to be in a place that he's going to again get hurt. He well, is I would argue and- that's, yeah, I would, I would shift this argument to a philosophical one about how you want to live your life. Okay? And so to me, you know, I'm making the choice to live my life hoping for the best. And I think anybody that right now, without the you know, the actual facts and evidence that's going to go, it's not going to work with Tua, is just somebody that wants to expect the worst and then maybe not be as miserable when it doesn't go well. And uh, who enjoys that? Come on. You uh, you have made a compelling argument. When you invoke Ted Lasso, it's like, oh, no, I'm I'm the antithesis of Ted Lasso. I, I don't I don't like how this feels. However, but we that's are... not real life. Ted Lasso is a bullshit story. Yeah, yeah. Like that's not a thing that happened. That's something what? conjured by Whoa. these creative mystics. Spoiler alert! But it's, like but it's not it's not you know it's not about the story itself. Whether that's real or not, it's about how you approach life. Ted Lasso provides all sorts of life lessons that we try and embody in our daily lives. And I failed here. However, I do have a role here on the show to provide at least somewhat sober analysis of the situation, and I think that too is bad. <laughs> Get over yourself. I the mean, analysis just... can't be, I hope. Well, if we're doing analysis, but I mean, Bill, you're, you're, that's what your analysis is. Like, uh, look, do, do you think... have a lot of evidence? Uh, have no, you watched I... Tua and gone, there's something there. Like, Justin Herbert's not in a great situation in law. He's got yeah, better but Justin children. Herbert it's... passes the smell test. The guy's a monster. Oh, I love you. I love test. you. But a I think smell it's a... test has oh, been passed, I... and Whitney's been thrown off into a train. But <laughs> I think for Bill, it's the same with the Sixers. Like, eventually, they're going to get it right. It's going to work. <laughs> do I think Do I think Tua's going to be Dan Marino? No. Do I think he could be a great system quarterback if it's built around him? Yeah. Oh, we'll that see what is such so he's a like a system quarterback. <laughs> uh, say, what an insult. Can, I mean, do I think he can be a good no, system Is that any difference than he's got a good old man basketball game, which was said about me? No, and I took it as a compliment. It, it is was a compliment. A compliment. It was, it was, so my point being, there's, there's been plenty, there's been plenty of great system quarterbacks that have won. Uh, uh, they just don't go down and remember as some of the greatest of all time. Bill, I don't want a system quarterback. Okay. We've had system so you quarter- we've, we've had system quarterbacks for 25 years. You don't want to you don't want to win. You don't want you don't want to win with Dilfer. You don't want to win with Rich Cannon. You don't want to Herbert. You'd rather lose with Herbert. Done with Dilfer's that great question. Put it on the poll. Roy at Lebetard. I mean Chris. I would rather go the rest of my life going 10 and 6 and going out in round 1. That's my question. Would you rather win with Dilfer? No, I don't want to win with Dilfer. Yes, you would. No, I don't. you're wrong. I'd rather win with Dilfer or win with Cannon. Roy, put it on the poll please at Lebetard. Tard show. Would you rather lose with Herbert than win with Dilfer? <laughs> it's a great question. It really is. Because the way you have to win with There's Dilfer, answer, all though. defense, 13 to 10 games, you're enduring all of these shit games. But you win. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I understand I understand the question. I'm asking. I mean, Mark <laughs> Sanchez, I got the two AFC championship games with him. Yeah. He was not the reason, but he's my favorite Czech quarterback of all time. Sure. I mean You pick Mark Sanchez over Richard Todd, yeah? Of course. Sanchez. O'Brien, over O'Brien or no? Yes, one hundred percent. Although those guys didn't win either. I know. So I mean it doesn't <laughs> Although Richard Todd just abused the Dolphins a bunch, which he did. bummed me out. Yeah. Now, Wani McSashes did not have the cultural impact that it felt like it had back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't a lot on the internet. There was like a pro football talk post reference to it. 
uh, where they reference one of the uh, the menu items. We so didn't I had to get go a lot back of coverage into... for actually converting a restaurant into Wani McStashes. Did we this were... happened before the internet? We were serving chicken finger mustaches. No, no, we were chicken mustaches. I enjoyed yeah. uh, pulling up a tweet from 2010 while, when we were promoting Wani McStashes, and there's supposed to be a photograph on it, but it's a link to a Plixi website that's now dead. <laughs> Plixi. <laughs> Twitter, from, <laughs> Twitter from 12 years ago. We did have spineless buffalo wings, stashed potatoes. Oh, uh, well, one... spineless buffalo wings, yeah. is, that's just... <laughs> Yeah. Mean. Yeah, that's not even. There's no I wittiness wonder, to I, it. I wonder why Juan <laughs> didn't do that cameo no, appearance. I was, by the way, I was, there's a question mark out there, and a couple of these were witty, and then the middle one is just like. Then we had loser fries. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, and then we had like the ba- the bad coach salad. How was that? I'm like, yeah. no. How was wonton soup? How do you like? How do you feel about wonton soup? Did you give him the uh, vanilla offense with no nuts? That was for dessert. <laughs> They did get progressively lazier. There, was, very little there was like a run LaShawn McCoy 200 times into the line of scrimmage pasta. Nah. I mean, yeah, you could read into that. You could read into it. I absolutely now want to serve a bad coach salad. <laughs> It's somehow less subtle than spineless chicken wings. <laughs> Vanilla offense with no nuts is the best we could do. I like right. stashed potatoes and I like wonton soup. Stashed potatoes, that's pretty solid. Yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't get you fired. That wouldn't get you fired on day one. The, the, you, how much of comedy writing has rejection in it? Oh, dude, it's painful. You have to be te- the my first um, my first job. I was so terrified as a staff writer, I was twenty one, to open my mouth, and the dude Rich Eustace that ran the show was just waiting for me to pitch a joke. And the second I pitched a joke, he, uh, he everybody got quiet. He's like, "Bill, we're trying to do a comedy up here." And uh, there was like a pause that my heart <laughs> stopped beating, Damn. and then everybody <laughs> everybody just started laughing at me. I'm like, "That's cruel! It's cruel!" But they know what the, they know what the ecosystem yes, is, right? So that yes. was welcoming you in. Hey, get used to that. Yeah, yeah. On a oh, Spin City, we worked right above Law and Order, and so whenever anybody pitched a, just a crap ass horrible joke, I would mimic them falling through the ground into the Law and Order writers room below us. So you'd be like, ah, ah, what are we doing down here? We're doing like a murder or some kind of- <laughs> uh, Why don't you go down there and work with the sexual assault cases that they're doing on SVU? Um, it's mean. It's cruel. You just have to uh, absorb the punishment and keep. You, I don't know what part of your story, right? You don't strike me just from meeting you energetically as someone who, when he was in his twenties, was Ted Lasso positive. No, like no, no. something happened there, right? Like to be the to be the writer who who buys into the idea of hope when people talk about right place, right time show during a pandemic. People are confused. Can I believe in something? Please. I don't get off. Your personality seems to me like it's got barbed wire on it. Yeah. You know what? um, Well, first, Ted Lasso, you know, there's a group of us creating that. But I got, I was an, I went optimistic way before that. I, I think it's a product of, uh, if you have really early success and I, uh, there's two ways to go. And one is to think that you deserved it and, um, uh, you know, walk around in that kind of narcissistic cloud where, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, you think that everything coming your way should come your way. And the other way is to be so tickled by it, you know, by the, the gift of lightning striking. You walk around, you know, my dad said to me on the phone once, he's like, you're one of those rare people that gets to enjoy what he does. And if I hear you complaining about your gig, I'm going to reach through the phone and smack you a couple times, you know? And so I think I took that path because I, 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 to this day, the fact that I get to sit around and make jokes with talented men and women and do things like come here and get to uh, talk to people that I'm fans of anyways. It's a, it's a, you know, to be negative, man, is a bad path. But it's harder, isn't it? It's easier to, it's easier to do scrubs, right? It's easier to do, it's easier to do something that has a lot of edge on it or has some snark or some cynicism. This is the harder thing, right? To give people syrup. That's not a note off. Yeah. But you know, I, I, I've, I, I think that I've always written with kind of relentless optimism and, uh, uh, with the undercurrent of people, uh, giving a crap about each other. Uh, and you know, even scrubs, we, you know, we, we, uh, had doctors, advisors, and the one rule we had on that show is we said, uh, we can be goofy and funny and silly, but these guys always have to be of service and girls and have to be care about the people they're taking care of. And I, 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 I love 
art and shows and movies like that where people care at the end of the day. And it might make me a, a closet softy, but I think, um, you know, the other side is, man, it's so easy to per- be pervasively cynical that it'll just drag you under, you know? And so I, mean, I made the choice pretty early on to kind of be relentlessly positive. What do you regard as the best writer's room that you've worked in? Just um, that the most fun when instantaneously you think back to, oh, we did a lot of laughing in there. Every day was a, lot, a good time. They're all different. The uh, I was on the uh, first year Friends, and it was hyper competitive, but it was raucously funny because it was a bunch of young men and women in a room really just kind of competing with each other to, you know, who could have the funniest joke and pop culture references in it. It felt like turning your job into a game, which you, I mean, you do bulletin board stuff all the time, yeah. apparently, you know? And so, you know, to know that you lost one day and go in and try to win the next day, that was great. Um, Spin Shitty, Spin City, we, 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 uh, the amazing thing for us, we were all super young and to have Mike Fox saying things that you uh, wrote was insane. And that was a sitcom in New York City uh, where I was 26 and I was afraid to hire anybody older than me because they'd know I didn't know what I was doing. So everybody there was between the age of 21 and 26. <laughs> and it was, and I had hair like my son, which is peroxide blonde. You, you got hiring power though that young? Yeah, for the writer's room, you know, because I, I created that show with a, a mentor that protected me, a guy named Gary Goldberg, who we talked about, who, who passed away, and he let me hire the staff. And I was just too worried about hiring grownups that had done the job before because they would have seen past the mask. You know, and been like, you don't know what you're doing. So that was a blast just because uh, uh, being young enough, we had food. We looked like this place. We had foosball tables and and uh, ping pong, and we probably wouldn't get around to work until midnight sometimes. It was awesome. Um, but everyone's a different experience, man. I've, I, I, there's been very few I haven't liked. To tell you Which the is the one that had uh, the greatest degree of difficulty getting a joke to, from your thought to to the play, to, 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 to success? To the script. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the cocky part of me will go, there's not many, because I, I started creating my own shows at like 25, 26, you know, so I was very lucky. The The first couple gigs I had, um, I got fired from uh, my first uh, three jobs in a row. I got I, I did a sitcom that got canceled, and then I got fired off Friends, The Nanny, and Boy Meets World. Boom, boom, boom. And I think all of them were because it took me a second to learn the rule that um, it's not your job to do things that make you laugh. It's your job to do things that make the creator and the showrunner laugh. You know? I don't know if that's Mike Ryan's philosophy. No, it's not. Certainly not Billy's. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem to be kind of the culture here at all, Dan. Yeah, <laughs> those guys really like to make themselves laugh. I think they're that's the that's the first audience, is it not, uh, Witty? Why? Is I mean, it- it's a, to be fair, it's done well. Look at us. Look at this wonderful palatial studio. <laughs> We're all our, trying our best to make ourselves look laugh Look at our YouTube every day. stream yeah. that had audio issues <laughs> early on. We fixed it, though. We're at the yeah, top of the mountain it. here, babe. It's pretty luxurious. Witty, why were you saying that there's not such a big difference between Draymond Green's new media and old media? What is it? Because Draymond keeps, um, he keeps hitting the note that he's at the front of a revolution that is here to attack, I guess, uh, Stephen A. Smith. I guess he's doing old people and uh, people who have a different uh, perspective on entertainers and criticizing entertainers than Draymond Green has. Draymond Green also has one note in respect to, you, can, you can't talk, I can. That's his whole thing is you person, even in the NBA. So I guess uh, there is a, a player, Austin Reeves, who doesn't like his nickname. I think they like. There's a might, big issue in LA. Yeah. By the way. I think they might call him like, is it like Hillbilly Jordan or yeah, something yeah, like the that? The one he really doesn't like, though, they call him AR 15. Right. You know well, I mean? yeah. I mean, that's that's and, not great. And yeah, he wants to ditch it. Yeah. So he's, he came out and said, I would not like to have be, be called that anymore. And Draymond Green said, you're not good enough to determine what your nickname is. You don't have enough stature in basketball. And honestly, he's kind of right. Stugatz can, exactly. <laughs> Stugatz can deliver that opinion. New media, we're not so different, you and I. Because all it is, it's just it's Stugatz giving hot takes. It's all it is. It's the same thing. Eventually, you get a rundown from the producers, a bunch of stories a day. All right, what's my take? Yeah, Austin Reeves, shut up. Like, that's how is it any different? Like, they're, me- they're meant to perform. But you know, pre- present this. We've played the game. We know the game. We know the culture of the locker room. We know what it's like to win championships, and we can provide a perspective that you can't. 
and it can't just be Austin Reeves. Shut up. It's a good it, take, it, though. It, it, it can't. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. I want to ask you guys the culture of "Hey, guy, you're not good enough." Shut up! I, I I keep bringing this story up. Mike James made it to professional basketball. Bill Lawrence can tell you, as somebody who plays still creatively and gets complimented by having old man game, that getting to get paid for playing basketball, what you have to climb over to make a profession of that, you have to be really good at basketball. Top one percent, right? Mike James says. Of Steph Curry, he's not top five. And the immediate reaction of everybody is who the fuck is Mike James? Yeah, he's not good enough. I mean, Mike James is not in the top 555 well, but, players but, but, of all but time. Who do Give I me have, LeBron James. But who do I have to make it so that you're not saying who the bleep is blank with Steph Curry? Like, if who has to say that Steph Curry is one dimensional for you to say, Okay, I'll consider it because you're as good as Steph Curry. I'm not going to dismiss you as get out of here, Mike James. Hmm. Or you want to hear the Hollywood metaphor? Because we talk about this a lot. The Hollywood metaphor uh, for this, and that's Mike has the answer. Go ahead, Mike. The, uh, the, the Hollywood metaphor for this, by the way, that we talk about a lot. Do you guys remember when critics of art and material used to be reputable and people know Paulina Kale? They'd know names, Ben Brantley, of people that did reviews. And so we in the business accepted criticism because you went, oh, these are people who went to school for it, studied for it, made their way up, you know, and then they would write these amazing think pieces about why this play, movie, or TV show is good or it sucks. And now, the literally within five minutes of your thing being available to be streamed on where it is, you can go on your phone and read 150 reviews from who knows who. You know what I mean? And so there's such a big negative backlash to it. The amount of comedy writers that write, you guys see in Ratatouille, the, the, the speech about, the amount of comedy writers and TV writers that constantly quote that stupid speech about any piece of art is better than the, the piece of shit that someone writes about it. It feels like it's the same culture right now because it's not just, but if you're asking me, I would put you guys up there as reputable enough to comment on whether or not. Uh, Steph Curry. Oh, your judgment is terrible. No, he's, <laughs> no, no, no. He's right about that. But to answer your question, Dan, like I think, listen. If I mean, not took, all of you guys. Not all of you. If guys. it was Mike Bibby instead oh. of Mike James, I think I'd be okay with him saying that about Steph Curry. But it's Mike James. Well, Mike James. How's Mike James Mike, doing Mike over James, in Europe? Mike James is a legendary European basketball player. Well, then rank he the won European an award players. Called most spectacular player. <laughs> How many years did he play in the NBA? How many years from Mike James in the NBA? He played for uh, the Nets in 2021. So, and he's played one year stops in Phoenix and New Orleans, but he's played for the best in Europe. Did he ever start in the NBA? Like for a season. He's the Steph Curry of Europe. He, he for yeah. a th he's a two-time Greek League champion, an Italian League champion, an All-Euro first teamer. I think I, I'm a, I might be a one-time Greek League champion. <laughs> he's <laughs> he's won the he was the best scorer in the Euro League. Like he has credentials. Give me, give me that trophy. What is the name of the award? Most spectacular person in the world. What yeah. is the name of that? So, it sounds like a great award. It sounds like it's better than most valuable player. You guys asked before. You can buy that award. So you can buy. You can definitely buy most spectacular person for, you, for your consideration. <laughs> Greek League most spectacular player. <laughs> what, is, what is that? What you is that? Can, you know when you yeah. see it. Everybody knows you can purchase a Golden Globe and you can purchase Most Spectacular Player. I've been meaning to ask you, with all of, all of your endeavors, are you a member of the Recording Academy? <laughs> <laughs> what do we need from the Recording I Academy? I have, I have a call today in 30 minutes to find out exactly what we need in terms of budget, and then I'll back channel directly with one of the company's co-founders to see if I can get a billboard put up in Iowa or something. <laughs> How much does this cost, Lawrence, to get nominated for these dumbass awards millions that you of dollars. people find? Millions of dollars. <laughs> millions of dollars. Millions and millions of dollars. None of this is going to work. By the way, I'm going to go back on what I said before about staying optimistic about the Dolphins. In this case, it's not going to happen. It's not going to work. Set no. your dial to disappointment. You know what's confusing is that there's two Mike Jameses that dominated European basketball. Yeah, there's a Mike James that played for the Cavs. Yeah, the Mike James that played for the good. Heat. Yeah, yeah, but they they both were really good. Most spectacular player, one that weighed in on uh, on Curry. He's the most recent one. Okay. He was the most spectacular. Player. I need to know MSP. what it goes into this award though, and is it better than most valuable player? Because if you tell me I'm walking into a room, I can win two trophies, and you can give me most valuable <laughs> player or most spectacular player. I think I want to be spectacular yeah, instead it sounds, of valuable. It sounds, so the it most amazing. Yeah. The most spectacular player award is the award given to the player that is deemed to have the most impressive highlight plays 
of the season. Ooh. They tend to be slam dunk plays, wow, so as according to the Greek Basketball League Most Spectacular Player Wiki entry. So it'd be John ja Moran for the NBA, yeah. right? He'd be MS, MSP? Yeah. MSP. Remarkably, <laughs> will you ask him? <laughs> Remarkably, a list of names that I actually recognize. Mario Hazonia won the most recent oh, edition. Right. Benassis Antetokounmpo was a two-time winner of the award. Wow. Mike James and Okara White, who wow. I remember used to play for Oh, Florida but I just State. realized yeah. that most spectacular player now is kind of not a great player. No, it's not as cool. I thought yeah. it meant, like, most charming, charismatic player. Yeah, I thought just yeah. an effervescent personality. Somebody sweet to well, Like, when you leave dinner with a guy, you're like, Real that guy was spectacular. <laughs> What'd you think about that dinner you had with Mike James? He was a spectacular guy. I believe the Miami Heat had like a ninety percent winning percentage when they started uh, when they started Okoro White in their starting lineup. Remember the Okoro minutes? God, Roy, put it on the poll, please. At Levitard Show, have you ever left a dinner with another man and said, "Wow, that was a really spectacular man"? Has anyone ever had that experience at dinner? I've liked someone, but I don't think I've ever left like just starry eyed. Like, I can't believe I would describe that person the way I would describe opening a champagne bottle. Just I can't, really, I can't that think was of a dinner. I can't think of a dinner that I didn't say that about somebody, if I'm just being honest. Because you're an amazing. But you weren't being a Hollywood <laughs> circles. You're, you said you're, about me. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, Roy's a spectacular s- guy. <laughs> he did say it about you, and again, I question all of Bill Lawrence's judgment. How dare you? I think that nothing has signaled that the football season is about to be ushered in, like what Stugatz just did. Radiant, buoyant. It feels like someone who has been in a dark room for a long time, and now, uh, not only in a dark room, but confined and and with no movement of freedom, and now they are coming out into the light because the Hall of Fame game has arrived. Mark Davis is eating a chicken wing with both hands. (laughs) Wearing all white. We were talking about Hawaii football yesterday. You could feel feel it off in the distance, and now making it truer than ever – We're not going to Dolphins camp this Friday, right, Whittingham? No, next week. Football is in the air, but I don't think it's been more in the air than Stu got saying, I've got a list of top five coaches (laughs) who better win this season. They have to win this season. Oh, yeah. They better win win this season. season. Now, last yeah. season, Mike Zimmer was on this list, correct? Mike Zimmer would have been, and, and now he's gone. You better win this season. That means playoff appearance and what, Stugatz? First round win? Like, what do we need to be doing in the playoffs? When you say better win, right? how, how are we defining that? These are coaches that need to make the playoffs. At the very least, they need to make the playoffs this year or enough. That's it. They're fired. They're gone. They need to win right now. I love these lists. If you remember, we had a very different list last year entering the season where we put coaches on notice, and some of them folded like a cheap lawn chair, and others went to the Super Bowl. That's right. Zach Taylor was put on notice. (laughs) This is different from the other list that Stu Gatz has. Stu Gatz, and I think this might be an overload. You guys might not be ready for this. Top five quarterbacks. Who need to do it right now? <laughs> wow. Right now? This, right now. This like right now. Who, who need to do yes. it right now? They yes. need to do it. Yeah. That's right. I don't, I don't even know much. what list I want I'm, first. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm dizzy. My eyebrows are singed. I Which, have the coaches list. I have to find the quarterback list. Oh, it's let's somewhere do the co- around. Let's, let's yeah. see the coaches. Yeah. Top five quarterbacks who need to do it right now. <laughs> Top try. five coaches who better win this season. Those are two different things. Yes, yes. Need to do it right now and better win this season. I don't know what the differences are, but they're different. Uh, they're different. Like, you know, doing it this season and doing it right now, you have to do it right now. Meaning starting with week one, you have to be good. You have to be good from week one for the entire season. How is that different than better win this season? You have to you win this lose, season. You, you can ha- lose, you, you can lose a game or two early, okay, but still make the playoffs and you return for another season. I love how about that. I love how your names are also the description. Yeah. So it's top five coaches who better win this season. They better. 
They have to win this season. They, okay, but thank you different. for clarifying because there was a you lot of confusion. You're saying have to, yeah. and it's and they better, have to win this season. They have to. Better. Listen, if they like their jobs, they probably want to win this season. Which, uh, they, yeah. But better win this season sounds more threatening than have to win this season. It does. They better win this season suggests like gulags or something terrible is going to happen beyond firing. It's not just hey, get out of here. Okay, top you, five coaches that better win this season. I mean, if that's what you want, that's what I'll give you. They better win you're this threatening season. Them yes. like that when you yeah. say they better. Better, that's be- that's more than half to. Totally fair. I'm number, good with that. Number five, Mike McCarthy. Got a good He's got to win right away. Strong I mean, list. I mean, Strong list. Might be low. That's I mean, number five. Got to Prescott needs five? to do it right now. Sean Payton's out there waiting to take his job. Yeah. Yeah, he's got to win right now, Dan. He That's different to. than better win uh, right it's now. It's my list, you know. Uh, but which list is it? Uh, it's you got to win this season. <laughs> That's not what the list is. Better win this season is a threat. Number four, Kevin Stefanski. I mean, McCarthy should have been higher. Really? Yeah. Ooh. I mean, Stefanski's going to have to better do it with <laughs> Jacoby Brissett, it might seem. Yeah, well, it's my list. Number three, Robert Sala. Really? Yeah. Does he? Yep. Are you sure? Yeah. Very wow. early in the life cycle. No, as Mike point, pointed Lots out earlier, there is a ton of talent. You have Zach I, Wilson. I did point out earlier that there was a ton of talent. <laughs> a ton of talent. <laughs> you have Zach Wilson. You drafted him. You drafted him very high in the draft, a lot higher than other people would have drafted him. Plus, you've surrounded him now with a ton of talent. And you're in a pretty bad division. You have the Bills and no one else, really. We think the Dolphins might be good. We think the Patriots might be good. The Jets have an opportunity, and Salah needs to do it they're, this they're season. They're the worst team in the division. That's uh, not true. You don't know that. They're it, talented. Put it on the poll, please, Roy. Do the Jets have a ton of t- by the, way, by the way, the the Patriots plus five hundred to win the division. The Jets plus twenty two hundred to win the division. For Expectations. I mean, how about Actually, that? Not bad. They're, a little yeah. they're the worst them. team in the division, and you don't have a quarterback. I don't know what you're doing. Uh, Salah needs to win right now, Dan. That is a very talented team. Okay, and maybe he's a system quarterback. He needs to but win right now. He is needs he to. Sa- Dan, I'm telling you right now, Woody Johnson's going to no, fire him. Better I'm win you. this season. Well, we'll needs see. to win right now is the quarterback My category. List. Yeah, but. I know it's your list, but they're two different lists. They're both your list, and you keep confusing the list. You don't think Sal is going to get fired if he doesn't make the playoffs? You think he's going to get the three years? You think Jet fans are that patient? You think Woody Johnson's that patient? Did he look patient when he was leading the Jet fans at training camp in the J-E-T-S Jet, Jet, Jet year? Duh. He has major expectations this year. Number, Needs to win this season. Number two. Matt Rule. Oh, that one's good. Yeah. Yeah. I am so tired of Matt Rule. The quarterback whisperer of the Carolina Panthers. He's so good that he has three quarterbacks. How about you make one of them good? He hasn't made any of them good. Sam Darnold's not good. He drafted Matt Corral. Now he has Baker Mayfield, who I'm rooting for, by the way. I want Baker to have a big year. But Matt Rule came in. He could have selected any job. He's the hot college coach. It's been two seasons. He's done nothing except draft quarterbacks and ruin quarterbacks. Do me a favor. Win now. How about that? Stu, he's actually not drafted quarterbacks, and that's been half uh, the problem. They agents. keep getting old uh, guys and just bringing them in like, oh, we'll just fix him, and then just right. never draft anybody. Because he's not a whisperer. That's that's the deal. You better start whispering now. Was he ever suggested to be a quarterback whisperer? Yeah, Matt he was. Rule? Yes, he was. At Baylor and Temple? Temple? Yeah, I'm telling Who's you. Who's the quarterback there? Look it up. Okay, there it is. Boom. What are you going to do with that, Tony? How about you just eat some look, look it up? up. Yeah, you got to look, look it up. I believe PJ <laughs> Walker was a quarterback at Temple. Oh, oh. Just Google Matt Rule quarterback whisperer. I don't think I mean, very much is yeah, going to come you'll, up, you'll except uh, a one internet search that uh, yeah. reveals that you have all the words, and it says Matt Rule is not a quarterback whisperer. <laughs> is the only thing you will find on the on the whole of the internet. Well, we'll see. Uh, is he a, he got a six year deal, right, Matt Rule? And this is his second year. And Stu Gatz has announced it. He's number two on. Coaches who better win this season uh, behind only. Wait, did you see what Matt Rule did at practice? This is Matt Rule's third season, correct? Yeah, right? he, yes. but, but he's taking control over a team. Hollywood Higgins and Baker Mayfield, a lot of people may remember their their tandem over in Cleveland. They're now in Carolina. Baker threw a deep touchdown pass to Hollywood Higgins, and they rolled out the red carpet and uh, finger uh, photo snapping celebration that they did in Cleveland so often. Matt Rule was having none of it. Everybody did laps. 
<laughs> you know why? Because he better win this year. Exactly. First Google search uh, comes out to a link from September 7th of 2021 when I put in Matt Rule quarterback whisper. It said, Panthers can be a sleeping giant if Matt Rule saves Sam Darnold. See? There you go. Somebody wrote a sentence on the internet. There you go. You looked it up. Yep. A year ago. Mm-hmm. Number one. Works for me. Brandon Staley. Uh, no. 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 What do you mean? He has. I the, love this. Thank you. He has the most talented quarterback perhaps in the game. Okay. And first two seasons has not made the playoffs. Now the quarterback only played last season, but he still hasn't made the playoffs with a talented quarterback and a very good team. He's Mr. Go for it on fourth down. Okay. He does it way too much, way too often. You know what, Dan? There's a time and a place for it. There's also a time and a place for a good punt, okay? And Brandon Staley hasn't learned that yet. He has the talent. He has the quarterback. He has to win this season. Single-handedly cost him the playoffs Thank last you. year yep. by not playing for the Go time. ahead. Cost him the playoffs again and see what happens. I mean, he's gone. What are you shaking your head about, Roy? We should put that on the poll. Is there a time and a place for a good punt? There is. There really is. Field position. It's a game of field position. It's all about okay. real estate acquisition. Yeah. That yeah. is a game. Thank you. I made a mistake with Sal. I feel bad about it. I did. I did. I've never done this before, but I have the names jumbled up, and I was trying. I don't know how fr- I, I, I mistook Robert Sala for, for Frank Reich. Because Frank Reich was really the coach I was thinking of. He has to win right now. He has to win this season. Now, he had his guy, Carson Wentz, their talented team. He's the top five happened. in what, all what sorts of up people. I, I, I don't you know what happened. happened. You make the look, mistake. Look, you look just look power it through. Here. I wrote it down. I scratched someone out, and I read the wrong name. Look, read it. Read it. You'll see what happened. You'll see. I, it's Tell your, the audience. It's your list, though. Tell the audience. I know. It's, yeah, but I sometimes I write down names, and then I think of a guy later, and I scratched out the wrong name, and it's Frank Reich. He had Carson Wentz. That was his guy a year ago. He did nothing. Now he has Matt Ryan, Matty Ice. They're a very talented team in a pretty bad division. In fact, a lousy division because the Jaguars are no good. The Texans are no good. And Frank Reich is supposed to be this great head coach. He's number three on the list. Robert Sala, congratulations. You have another year. Okay. Let me uh, let me just go over real quick just how sloppy all of this was because oh, it's somehow it. sloppier yeah. on what yeah. he's written down. We will get to top five quarterbacks who need to do it right now I'm in a second. I think th- I think since 2018, the Colts have had a different starting quarterback for week one every year. Well, how about you make one good? Uh, how about that? He got his guy, Carson Wentz. He wanted Carson Wentz. Because he coached Carson Wentz when he was in Philadelphia and had the big year. He got him last year, and Wentz was a disaster. Everyone is raving about Matt Ryan. Okay, but everyone was raving about Carson Wentz last year. I mean, and it's a lousy division, Mike. Will you guys? And the Colts please, have to make the playoffs. Will you guys uh, please? Somebody in the other room. Is anyone fluent in Stugat back there? Because this is what I've got of this list that he's written down that he's handed That's me. A good okay. List, yeah. It's number five is McCarthy, but then number five, I see Kingsbury is there, and he's been scribbled out. Yeah, you see what happens. That's what I'm telling you. Now, Kingsbury, my debatable. It's like a rough I mean, draft. Number yeah. four is Stefanski, but Kyle, someone has Kyle something. It, it's Shan, it's S H A. You were gonna put Kyle Shanahan it, I, on but there, but it's not an S. It's a T. It's I Kyle. Up on it. No, yeah. he didn't even finish the last name. It's Did you three think it letters. Was Kyle Stefanski. Uh, I just I realized that Shanahan's safe. Like he's fine. He's been but, a Super but, Bowl. But, he's been an NFC Championship game. He's okay. But I mean, number he lost th- a lot of tough. Number three, <laughs> he does have a lot of tough. Number three is Robert, and then it's S E L, and then off to the side is Melt R U E. Yeah. It's Melt R U E. Mel Tucker at Michigan State. I think it's Melt Rule. I think oh, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Number three is now Staley. Friend. Number mm. three is Staley. Frank Reich is number two and is scribbled down. And number one is also Staley. Mm-hmm. Yep, my yep. list. It checks out. <laughs> checks out. <laughs> what a what a t- individual. <laughs> Time top five quarterbacks who need to do it right now tomorrow. <laughs> At the All-Star Game for Baseball, Stugatz, we were talking about how the televised product can be improved by getting us closer to the real stuff, to the microphones, to the honest back and forths. And I saw last night, we were talking earlier in the show with Mike Schur about Edwin Diaz, uh, the cool closer for the Mets. The Mets matter, okay? The Mets 
are getting television numbers that seem small, right? They just had a series against Atlanta where the average viewership was 430,000 people. It's the highest in the history of that network. The Mets matter playing against the Braves. The last game uh, got 550,000 people watching. Major League Baseball has something interesting going on. The Mets matter. The Yankees matter. The Dodgers matter. South uh, uh, Southern California matters. And if you ask Major League Baseball, which markets do you need to matter? They would tell you those plus Boston. But you just got to this part, even though you are a Mets fan late, yeah. and uh, baseball has run off some of this show over the years. But what I've seen discussed at, uh, regarding Edwin Diaz last night and before, because he's a power arm, because he strikes everybody out and because of the confidence he gives when he gallops in from the bullpen, his music, Stugatz, and is the name of the song, is it Narcos or yeah. is it Narco? The name, I'll, I'll look, I'll look whether it, it's a plural it's or not, but trumpets, it's incredible. And, and him walking in with the camera right behind him, over his shoulder, okay? And you see the place swing open. The bullpen swings open, and this guy, it's beautiful, to watch. it's artistic, it's theatrical, and then the trumpets hit, and you know you've got a badass who throws harder than everybody else and strikes everybody out. And it's it's whether it's Wild Thing Charlie Sheen in the movie Major League, whether it's Enter Sandman for Mariano Rivera. What did uh, Trevor Hoffman came into something? I remember Lee Smith used to walk purposely slow to the mound because He's one of the bad man, one Lee of Smith. the coolest things yeah. in sports is the guy with the big arm walking out of the bullpen because your fan base knows. That he's to be feared. Well, they know the game's over. The Mets are when they have a lead, they are sixty-one and zero uh, after the eighth inning. Sixty-one and zero when they have a lead going into the ninth because of this pitcher. Trevor Hoffman was hell's bells, and uh, this song is this music is distinctly Latin, and you see what goes through Shea Stadium in a part of New York that's distinctly Latin. It's it's it feels like Caribbean baseball. It feels like. Uh, I, baseball games played not in the United States. It's tough to be badass with a trumpet, but that's what that oh, song man. does. Oh it's a great God. entrance. Uh, Eric Gagne was one of my favorites. I got to see that at Dodger Stadium once when he came out to Welcome to the Jungle. He would come out of the bullpen. There'd be a logo of his face and the words game over when he was unhittable. Like That was intimidating because what did he, what did he go? Like a season and a half not surrendering a blown save? Like I love the badass closer. Jonathan Papelbon had the dropkick Murphys, and you knew when that came out, I was like, okay, doors closing. I saw the other day, Stugatz, uh, Shohei Otani. I don't know if you know what his walk-up music is, but it's uh, it's Lil Wayne, and it's Showtime is his walk-up music. That's uh, That's what he is borrowing from our culture. Is there anything, when you think of entrances with music, is it possible that there's anything cooler than mariano rivera's languid gate when you know what's walking into the game and you know that the people in the other dugout know what's walking into the game coming in to enter sandman are you saying this is as good as that i'm not saying this is as good as that um I think Rivera has the best entrance of any pitcher in the history of baseball. And it's going to be hard to eclipse even Diaz with the Mets. I understand. Like, listen, it's fun to watch. It's fantastic. The crowd gets really into it. But you got to win some first, you know, and they haven't won a thing oh, wait a minute. yet. So you're not even doing it about the moment. Some you're you're too, just yeah. doing the, the retroactive excellence. I mean, you're when Rivera was walking in, Dan, it started off nice and it was cool at the beginning. But then you knew the greatest no, relief you pitcher just, you've no, ever seen you just, was walking what, into that music. What, I did. I applied winning. You just winning. did yeah. to Edwin yeah. Diaz do it in the playoffs with your walk up uh, music. I did. I mean, it's the regular <laughs> season. Eck used to come out to bad to the bone by George Thurgood. He's got a couple of rings. I mean, no, but I mean, to Stugatz's this point, there is a certain story that gets told and Edwin Diaz is telling his, as you said, 61 and zero after the eighth inning. I think if you could transport me right now to anywhere in sports as something cool happens, I think I might pick Edwin Diaz coming out from the bullpen. It's like pretty it, cool. It, and especially, I think uh, this weekend there was a national Fox game 
And with the added resources, they had a handheld camera guy walk us right behind him. from the bullpen with one no, of those spider cool. cams. It, it was, was cool. unbelievable. It was so sharp. It looked like a movie. It, it, him he blows in. a save in the postseason, though. Watch those Met fans turn on him. I mean, he will have no idea what hit him. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna leave the field with a trumpet up his ass. 